Okay, you should be all set. Great, good morning. You're here with the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. I am Mark Lawrence. I am the uh, Senate Chair of the committee. I represent Southern York County, which is Kittery, Elliott, South Berwick, half of Berwick, the town of York, and the town of Agunquit. Um, and in a moment, I'm gonna be going around the committee uh, to ask members to introduce themselves. And I'll start off with uh, my House Co-Chair, uh, Representative Barry. Who now has this sound turned on? Great achievement for the day. Good morning, everyone. My name is Seth Barry. I represent House District 55, which is Bowdoin, Bowdenham, most of Richmond and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec where the ice is out. Great, thank you very much, Representative Barry. I'll go to our House Republican lead, uh, Representative Wadsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. I am Nate Wadsworth and I serve the uh, District of 70, towns of Hiram Porter, Brownfield, Fabric, and Lovell. And then to our Senate Republican lead, uh, Senator Stewart. Hey, good morning, folks. I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator in District 2, which is 51 communities in Aroostook and Penobscot counties, and I reside in Presque Isle. Representative Foster. Good morning. I'm Steve Foster. I represent District 104, uh, which includes the towns of Garland, Exeter, Stetson, Charleston, and Dexter, where we still have plenty of ice and uh, two to three feet of snow in the woods. Representative Ziegler. Um, good morning. I'm Representative Paige Ziegler. I represent District 96 in Moldo County, where we don't have as much snow. Um, and I represent the seven towns of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Lottenville, Morrill, Palermo, and Searsmont. Representative Kessler. Good morning, Chris Kessler, uh, representing part of South Portland and a smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. And Representative Cuddy. Good morning, my name is Scott Cuddy and I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville, and I live in Winterport. Representative Grahowski. Good morning, everyone. Representative Nicole Grahowski. I serve the city of Ellsworth, the town of Trenton, and House District 132. And Representative Sachs. Good morning, everyone. My name is Melanie Sachs. I represent House District 48, which is Freeport and part of Pownall. Great. And we will have um, members of the committee coming in and out today. The legislature, legislative committees are trying to finish up their business. Uh, most committees have finished. We're one of the committees that is having trouble finishing, and I'll go over the schedule at this point to let you know where we're at. So this is the uh, essentially the extension week that we've asked the presiding officers for to try to finish up our work. Um, and uh, we got a report, or the chair's got a report from our analyst, uh, Lindsay Laxon, which you're all welcome to get a copy of, and I'll go over with you now. Um, the good news is, is that there are 12 bills uh, that have been reported out and are out of our committee and either have appeared on the uh, Senate or House calendar or will be appearing shortly on the Senate and House calendar. There are also seven bills that we voted on um, that are in the process of being reported out. I don't know whether or not any of them will have language reviews. I don't believe they will, but they should be reported out shortly. The difficult news is that we have nine bills that we have not yet voted on and we need to work uh, to get those out. And the even worse news is that we still have seven bills that we haven't even heard at this point that we're going to be hearing tomorrow and then we need to work and report out. So we've got a lot of work to be done uh, this week. Today is gonna to be a work session. So Representative Barry and I set the calendar. Today is gonna to be a work session and everyone should know that all bills that have been heard are on for work session every day, but we particularly designated uh, five bills today. Um, they are LD, and excuse me, I have to turn my light on. Uh, they are LD 634, LD 1350, LD 1955, LD 634, and LD 697. Um, and we are also going to discuss in committee day, in committee today, uh, our budget letter, which needs to be reported out, and uh, the GEA follow up. Um, we'll be working today. We're going to be taking a break about 10 30 uh, for 15 minutes to give people a chance to get off Zoom. 
and uh, gets them some downtime and also to allow our analysts and our clerk to catch up on matters uh, while we're off, offline. Uh, then we'll be taking a break for lunch. It'll be about an hour, probably be somewhere around uh, 12, between 12 and one o'clock, we'll uh, begin our break. Uh, we'll be coming back. We'll be taking an afternoon break sometime around 3.30 um, for 15 minutes and then going till we get uh, done today, what we can get done today. Tomorrow we have um, seven public hearings. Those seven bills are scheduled for public hearing and I won't go over with you which they are. They appear on our calendar. On Thursday, we are in Augusta um, in the joint House and uh, Senate sessions and expect to see some reports from EUT coming onto the calendars. And if they are divided reports, you wanna check those out in advance so you can get ready for your debate. Then we're gonna hold a work session on Friday. We have two bills that are our priority on uh, working that day. Um, LD 1959, uh, LD 1913, and LD 1107. And then we're gonna work anything else and anything and everything we can um, to get what we can done uh, before the deadline. We're at the point where leadership will begin taking bills out of committee and either killing them or putting them in the dead files if we don't complete our work on these bills. So we have a lot before us today. So you should plan pretty much all of today, all of Wednesday and all of Friday uh, to work in committee so we can get these things done. Um, any question from committee members before we get started today? I don't see any hands raised. Um, so uh, we'll go into our work session and I'll just, just ask uh, Lindsay to come online and introduce herself uh, because she will be obviously involved in the work session today. Good morning, my name is Lindsay Laxon. I am a legislative analyst with the nonpartisan office of policy and legal analysis. Okay, and again, if you wanna anytime committee members wanna see that, um, calendar that uh, Seth and I have been working on or the list of bills uh, still in committee, just contact Lindsay and she can provide that to you. So in no particular order, um, I'm gonna lay uh, before us today um, uh, LD 634 and I'll take a motion from somebody to go into work session. So move. Seconded by Senator Stewart, seconded by, who is that second by? Uh, I was one of Kessler. Um, Representative Kessler. Kessler. Everybody in favor of going into the work session, raise your hands. Okay, we're now in work session. So we'll begin working LD uh, 634. Is this a bill we've worked before, Lindsay? Um, there was a work session back in April. It was April 8th of 2021. Uh, this bill was discussed in conjunction with um, several other bills. Um, so I, I mean, I have some bill analysis that I can send out, um, but I, you know, that's go it basically kind of giving an overview of 634 as drafted. So I could send that out and walk the committee through it if you'd like. And Why don't you do that very briefly since it's always almost been a year since we reviewed this bill? just to refresh our memory on the bill. Excellent, so I just sent that out by email and bear with me one moment while I share my screen. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Excellent, okay. So LD 634, an act to cap the value of contracts for renewable resources and distributed generation resources. Um, the bill limits the total value of renewable energy credits contracted for under the Renewable Portfolio Standard Procurement Laws to the reasonable costs associated with making a Class 1A resource commercially operable plus $100,000. The bill requires the PUC to adopt routine technical rules to establish a method for determining the contract limitations on each contract and to otherwise implement the limitation. Um, the bill also establishes a similar cap uh, for distributed generation um, and also requires rulemaking. So the committee had a public hearing on March 16th of 2021 um, and a work session in April. 
Um, you can see the committee received testimony from folks. Um, there were, at the public hearing, there were concerns raised um, that the renewable portfolio standard procurement was successful and this may complicate things um, and that the distributed generation procurement was being discussed by stakeholders at the time. And so that may yield proposed changes to the plan. Um, some of the specific issues uh, raised at the public hearing, um, the PUC expressed concern about the feasibility of this level of review with existing resources. Um, and they also had some specific questions with respect to the language of the bill. And we do not have a preliminary fiscal impact statement at this time. So with that, Great. I will stop sharing my screen and see if folks have questions for me. I don't think we'd have any questions. What I'll do, Lindsay, is I'm gonna go directly to Senator Stewart since he is the sponsor of the bill and see where we are at on this bill. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Lindsay, for your work on this. Um, uh, actually, as early as this morning, um, we've got a, a proposal um, that I'll be putting forward um, in collaboration with uh, the governor's energy office that uh, deals with um, the, 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 the acknowledgement that costs um, for rate payers that are, have gone up in the last year uh, in large part because of the, the standard offer increases. Um, but certainly there's an impact that this program will have that's directly tied to that as well. Um, and uh, we, in, in, in trying to find a reasonable way to address this, what we would like to do um, is put forward an amendment to this bill that effectively is going to uh, create a cap that um, on, on the high level of the rates that could be garnered by uh, these projects with um, tied to the 2020 rates as opposed to um, the, the ongoing uh, fluctuating rates that we're seeing here with our, our standard offer increases and, and whatnot. So um, I don't know if Mr. Burgess is in the participants. I'm looking, I'm looking. I do not. I do not see him. I see Mr. Harwood is there. Um, I don't know if, if anybody from the governor's energy office would like to um, expand on that idea a bit. Um, in talking with him this morning, we're going to have language for the committee uh, to that effect that we can provide so that you folks can take a look at it. Um, we'll have that for you today. Um, happy to continue to discuss this more. Um, and then if folks want to wait until that language is in front of them, um, we can, you know, I'm, I'm happy to make a tabling motion after that uh, discussion and whatnot. And then we can uh, pick it back up after folks have had time to review the physical, the uh, written language. Up to you, however you want to proceed, Mr. Chair. So Trey, would your intent be then to essentially replace your bill with what the GEO is reporting? That, that is correct, yep. Okay, okay. And um, Jason, is Melissa Winnie in the, um, in the um, waiting room? Uh, yes, she is. Okay. Um, can you beam her across? And I just wanna see where Dan Burgess is at on this amendment. Okay, I promoted her. Hi, hey, Melissa. Um, I see Dan isn't on, but I understand your office has been discussing an amendment with this. Can you just give us an update on where uh, the amendment is in the process and when we may see it today? Is she up? Oh, there she is. There you go. Good morning, Senator Lawrence and Representative Barry. Members of the committee, I'm Melissa Winnie, an energy policy advisor in the governor's energy office. I heard the tail end of your question. Are you asking about timing for that language? Correct. Uh, Senator Stewart has indicated that he would be amenable to replacing his entire uh, bill with the amendment coming from the GEO. And we just wanted to get a time frame of when we would be able to review that amendment. Great. Thank you, Senator, for repeating that. Um, Yes, yeah, so we will have language that we can share um, with Senator Stewart today. And so that timing works on our end as well and appreciative of the Senator for being willing to work with us on that. 
Do you know what time today that we might be able to get it? I can check in with the team. Um, I know the preference is the earlier, the better. So I will relay that message and I don't have a specific timing at this point though. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So are there any motions from the committee, Representative Barry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I appreciate the interest in looking at this issue. And I know uh, the governor's energy office has been working hard on ways to make some changes before the legislature adjourns to the net energy billing program of the state. Um, I do think that it's important to have a hearing on that language. And so in the interest of efficiency, knowing that the committee has limited time to deal with it, um, I would be happy to offer up one of my concept drafts that has not yet had a hearing so that we could incorporate this language in that way. Um, you know, I, I think the main thing is that the public have a full chance to weigh in on the language at a hearing and um, I mean, we could do it either way, but it might be more efficient to do it, uh, you know, with a with an, a bill that has not yet been heard. Uh, the bill I'm thinking of is on the docket for tomorrow. The amendment that I have was just about to go out, but this would certainly be in keeping with that title, and uh, we could do it that way if we want to make sure there's a public hearing. Thank you. Any other thoughts from the committee, Senator Stewart? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I mean, the spirit of the bill has been, you know, to try to get under control the, the costs that are associated with this program. And I mean, I think that that spirit was reflected at the public hearing on this bill a year ago. I, I just looked at the testimony. There were a number of folks that testified, um, a lot of whom are um, in the attendees list. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, if we wanted to, we could post the language tonight and, I'll, and I'm happy to make this language publicly available as soon as, as it's available, um, garner that feedback, uh, rather than starting a new, I mean, I don't, I, I, I think it's probably, um, at this stage of the game, no matter what we do, it's going to be fast, <laughs> uh, whether it's a new, a new, totally new bill tomorrow or just posting the amendment tonight or today. Um, and then maybe take it up at the end of the work of the uh, public hearings tomorrow. Um, if you want to allow folks, you know, 24 hours or whatever to review the language, which is probably about the same time frame they'd have if we started tomorrow a new either way. So, um, I, I don't suspect you'll get much change other than uh, in, in terms of the testimony and those who, who will testify um, or provide feedback, you know, maybe it's a little less um, um, intense because of the fact that it's a, it's more or less a, a watered down version of what my proposal originally was, but um, I think you'll get a lot of consistency in, in what, that proposal and what, and what that feedback is from stakeholders. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, although I greatly appreciate uh, uh, Representative Barry's uh, uh, offer, uh, I would suggest that uh, we on this committee are handling, have handled and will handle a lot of bills where that the public hearing was held a year or so ago. And, uh, I think that uh, just uh, singling out this one to suggest we need a new title to, so that we have to hold the public hearing really uh, is irrelevant at this point. I would suggest, uh, I have a, several questions for those that I see in attendance on the current language, and I will have questions probably in regards to the amended version. So I would just suggest that when the governor and the office Governor's Energy Office gets there, uh, uh, gets this out, that it go out to uh, interested parties as well so that they have a chance to look at it before 
we actually go into the work session on it and I move to table. Okay, Second. so Representative Foster, you know, tabling motions are not allowed until while it's being debated or during debate. So I'll go to Representative Kessler, I think who had his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to motion to table as well. Okay, there's been a motion to table. Is there a second? Seconded by Senator Stewart. Tabling motions are non-debatable. So all those in favor of tabling? One, two, three, keep your hands up. Four, five, six, seven. All those opposed? Paige, do you have your hand up? Paige? I voted to on the first You voted vote. yes to table? Yes. Okay, Representative Sachs are opposed. Representative Berry is opposed. And those are the only two I see opposed, is that correct? Okay, so it sounds like the vote is eight to two to table. So this bill is tabled. Um, just so you know, my intent is to bring it up later today during our work session. And I just ask the, um, the governor's energy office to come back to us with language so we can get it publicly distributed as soon as possible. Um, I would just say that um, I agree with the sentiments that we've heard this bill, uh, these concepts before everybody who would be interested in this bill would be interested in Senator Stewart's bill. And my understanding as the governor's energy office language has been already been talked about with the interested parties. So I don't think there's any danger of people not being aware of what's going on. So in the interest of time, I'll bring it back up later today when we have the governor's energy office language and we can see what we want to do uh, with the bill at that time. Uh, the, okay, so the next one on our um, agenda today is um, LD 1350, Expand Maine's Clean Energy uh, Economy, sponsored by uh, Senator Vitelli. Uh, refresh our memory, Lindsay, when did we hear this bill and um, have you done our re your report to our committee? I have not done a report on this bill. Um, so the public hearing on LD 1350 was back in April of 2021. Um, there was a work session in June of 2021, but I don't believe that um, there was actually discussion over the bill analysis. So if the committee would like, I can send out um, bill analysis to the group and we can walk through it. Why don't you do that? Um, I don't know if Deirdre did the analysis or was it you, Lindsay, who did the analysis? Um, Deirdre had done some analysis. Um, I did my own. So bear with me one moment. Okay, and while we're doing, while we're doing the analysis, we've asked uh, Eloise to see if she can join us. Uh, she has other hearings going on today too as well. Would you like me to hold off? Nope, go ahead. Uh, we need to move ahead. We can't um, continue to wait on things. Okay. Um, all right. So this bill, um, LB 1350, amends the state's renewable portfolio standard procurement law to authorize two additional competitive solicitations by the PUC for contracts with Class 1A resources. Um, and there are specific amounts that are um, set. And these are related to... Um, so it's... <laughs> Amount of energy or renewable energy credits equal to 15% of retail electricity sales in the state uh, during the calendar year 2019. Um, the bill also amends the renewable portfolio standard procurement law to require the PUC in conducting a solicitation and selection of class 1A resources to give special consideration to the selection of projects in economically depressed areas of the state and to give consideration to evidence of project viability. Um, at the public hearing, the committee received testimony um, the proponents talked about, um, you know, growing Maine's renewable energy resources, um, the importance of special considerations for economically depressed areas, and supported the inclusion for energy storage. Um, opponents expressed concern about long-term contracting and the exposure of uh, ratepayers to the associated risks, um, and felt that the inclusion should be on focus on uh, renewable procurements. Um, and questions about whether additional generation is necessary. 
Um, there were some general suggestions provided at the public hearing, um, allowing existing class 1A resources to participate, um, expanding the focus to uh, transmission infrastructure, um, carve outs for wind and solar to allow competition on cost and not just on transmission, um, and then setting the procurement to align with the state renewable energy market assessment. Um, there were some information requests from the committee, um, which I wanted to highlight. Um, so Representative Foster had requested information related to repowering and refurbishment of solar and wind, asking if there was a recycler available for that. Um, and actually later on in the hearing, um, Dan Hendrick spoke to this a little bit, talking about some of the work that Clearway Energy Group had been doing. Um, Representative Barry asked for specific standards and language for work session related to job quality and labor standards as recommended in testimony. Um, Representative Barry also noted that CMP's testimony included recommendations for cost recovery provisions and wanted to hear from the GEO on that. Um, Representative Barry asked if re-energy is able to sell into markets outside of Maine, for example, in New Brunswick and take advantage of incentives offered in other regions. Um, he also requested information about the costs associated with interconnection and the ways it could be financed if Maine were to provide renewable energy to meet demands outside of the state. Uh, Representative Grahowski requested data regarding trends in the conversion of prime Maine farmland to non-agricultural purposes. Um, and Representative Foster requested information from the PUC regarding whether it could recommend a long-term contract period. Um, the PUC provided written follow-up um, on May 7th stating in part 20 year terms appear to be uh, sufficiently long to support projects with contractual pricing terms that appear favorable given current energy market outlooks. They said it was less clear for 10 to 20 year contracts. Um, and there were some specific language suggestions included in the testimony. Um, I won't read through those, you've got them. Um, and we do not have a preliminary fiscal impact statement at this time. Um, however, uh, the sponsor did have an amendment um, that went out this morning. Um, so that was sent out and I, you know, I can certainly provide the committee with a little information on that, but I will stop for the time being and see if anyone has any questions for me. Great. First of all, are there any questions for Lindsay? Okay. So Eloise has joined us and I appreciate the diligence, Eloise. Eloise had to go out for an appointment this morning and she stopped and is in her car. Um, I understand she has an amendment to present, and I understand that uh, Jeremy Payne from MREA is also interested in speaking to it, and you've been working with the Governor's Energy Office um, through this process. So I'd ask you, Eloise, if you want to present your amendment, um, and do you want Lindsay to go pull it up on the screen and go over it? Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Yes, it would be great to have uh, Lindsay go over the amendment because I think it has some significant changes to it. And then for further information and details, since I don't have it in front of me to refer to, I think having either uh, Jeremy Payne or whoever's from the GEO walk through the details of it would be very helpful. Okay, so why don't we pull up, have Lindsay pull up the amendment and you can walk us through it. And then we'll go to Jeremy Payne and then Melissa Winnie from the GEO. Okay. Are you able to see my screen, please? Yes, we are. Excellent. All right. Um, so Senator Vitelli's proposed amendment um, makes some changes to the alternative compliance payment. Um, so this will now include class two uh, resource portfolio requirements and it sets the maximum um, at $15. Um, for that associated payment. Scroll down. Uh, the amendment also changes the um, renewable resource report requirements. So now it's with the G. Now it's with the GEO in consultation with the PUC, and it expands the report uh, to include Class Two and Class One, not just One A. Going. Okay. And so here are the changes to competitive procurement. Um, so the, um, and this, well, this is the amendment, um, but it also expands on some existing bill language. So there'll be two additional, two competitive solicitations under paragraph B1. So if we go down to what those look like. Um, so the commission shall procure additional energy or renewable energy credits from class 1A resources. Um, 
and they will initiate, so the commission shall initiate the competitive solicitation under this paragraph and ensure that that solicitation results in the approval of contracts by December 1st, excuse me, 31st, 2023, for energy or renewable energy credits equal to 7.5% of the retail electricity sales in the state for 2021, reduced by the amount of class 1A resources procured pursuant to section 3210 by January 1st, 2023, as determined by the commission. Um, and if the commission finds that any contracts entered into under paragraph A are unlikely to result in the procurement of energy specified in the contracts, the commission shall initiate by January 31st, 2024, a competitive solicitation to procure an equivalent amount of energy. Um, the amendment updates some of the dates. And then in addition, um, the commission in, in the solicitation and selection um, will give consideration to the expected effect of selected class 1A resources on other renewable resources uh, due to congestion and curtailment. Um, the amendment also adds a uh, factor for consideration um, for the PUC when they have to weigh the benefits to rate payers and the state's economy and includes a consideration of use of agricultural land uh, the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry has found to be contaminated uh, with, I think it's PFAS. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Um, so that's a new consideration to be added. Um, the commission also will give special consideration to energy storage systems. Um, and we'll look at, um, in the case of energy storage systems that are at a different location from the Class 1A resource, um, the PUC will publish a methodology for making that evaluation and must comply it consistently to all applicable bids and contracts. Removes the requirement um, that for energy storage systems that it has to remain under the same ownership. And then lastly, um, in advance of conducting a solicitation under this section, the commission in coordination with the GEO and the Office of the Public Advocate will seek opportunities to coordinate with other New England states um, entities designated by those states or other buyers in order to achieve a positive or neutral effect on the rate payers in Maine. And that is the amendment. So I will scroll back to the top. I will stop sharing my screen. And if folks have questions or if others are speaking to this and you need me to share my screen again, just let me know. Okay, uh, so are there questions for Lindsay or Eloise about the amendment? Great. Uh, why don't we bring uh, Jeremy Payne over? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Barry, you have a question? Yeah, I actually did have um, some questions uh, as a follow up to the bill analysis, um, which I think are still pertinent to the amendment. So at some point, I just wanted to see if there are um, folks in you know, attendance who could answer those questions that I didn't get answered back at the hearing. Okay, so I'm a little confused, Seth. Do you have a question now or you want me to go to Jeremy first? If you wanna go ahead to Mr. Payne, that's fine. I just, I wanna make, I just wanted to flag those things uh, before we get too far down the road here. Do you wanna present can, your questions now? Well, they were asked as part of the bill hearing um, referenced in Lindsay's analysis. So okay. I think okay. we've all seen them. I just want to make sure that they get answered. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure we can ask people to answer them. Um, so is Jeremy beamed across, Jason, and Melissa as well? Oh, there's Jeremy. Why don't you go ahead, Jeremy? And first of all, if you could give us your feedback on the amendment and try to answer the questions that Representative Barry had proposed and asked last year. Sure, so uh, good morning, uh, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. I'm Jeremy Payne with Maine Renewable Energy Association. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, offer some feedback. Uh, I'll, I'll start by saying, Representative Barry, happy to try and answer your questions if you wouldn't mind just reminding me of what they are. Um, and if I can't, I certainly will commit to providing you those answers uh, uh, after the fact. Um, 
but first, I mean, I think specifically to this language, the idea here was to build on the success of LD uh, uh, 1494s, uh, the two tranches of procurement that happened a couple of years ago. Um, you've heard the PUC come in and speak a couple of different times about how that uh, those two procurements were um, were very successful and very competitively priced. Um, so this is really building off that. Um, there's really not a whole lot of difference in terms of the way it's proposed to work. Um, probably that the biggest mechanical difference is that it would really only allow new resources to bid. As you may recall, the, uh, the last procurement um, created space for existing and new resources to bid. So this would just be for new. Um, and it also, the amendment here um, reduces the size of the procurement. The original bill envisioned procuring 15% of uh, 2019 retail electric sales and putting that under contract. This is now moving to 7.5%. That was essentially an acknowledgement that we've done a lot of procurement. Um, and we also wanted to leave some room in the future to potentially procure some amount of offshore wind. Um, it also, as you heard Lindsay say, does create a new alternative compliance payment rate for class two resources. There isn't one now. So this would create a new price of $15 um, that provides some rate payer benefit, but also provides some certainty that those class two resources can, uh, can, can continue operating and provide their uh, clean renewable power to our mix. Um, the other thing it does on the top of page three is it talks about basically backfilling any megawatts um, via another contracting process. So if something happens to any of the projects that were awarded contracts in the first two tranches and they're not going to be built, because that certainly happens for lots of different reasons, this essentially says um, that the PUC shall initiate a fourth tranche by January 31st of 2024 to procure whatever number of megawatts did not go forward from the first two tranches. So it's the, the idea here is, is let's keep positive momentum going. And if all we've done here is award contracts for projects that are not going to be built, that doesn't really serve any purpose. So let's acknowledge that and make sure that we have a process in place to procure those missing megawatts. Um, and then it also talks about, as, as Lindsay said, um, trying to give some acknowledgement for projects on PFAS land. I, I think everybody is certainly well aware that we've got some pretty significant challenges with PFAS, and we have examples of landowners whose livelihoods and economic vitalities have been destroyed literally overnight once they discovered that their um, their land had PFAS on it. So this is this is a, a way to allow for some of those projects to move forward and maybe give them a little bit of a boost, uh, a leg up. Uh, in the commission's review of those bids. Um, and then other than that, it's just the last piece that is encouraging you know, to make sure that the governor's energy office and the public advocate um, are exploring all opportunities to partner with other states in the region on these types of procurements. So if there's a way for us to procure X amount of megawatts um, and Massachusetts or somebody else wants to um, partner up with us and that can help reduce some of those costs, then that's great. Um, it, it just is sort of an encouragement. It's not a mandate that, you know, we must procure some amount um, from some other New England state. So uh, happy to try and answer any questions about any of that or, or again, back to Representative Barry's questions as well. Hey, why don't we go ahead now with questions for Jeremy Payne. And I apologize, Jeremy, did you introduce yourself at the start? I did, a quick rambling okay. intro, yes. Good, thank you. Uh, Representative Cuddy. Thank you, um, thank you for that uh, rundown, Mr. Payne. The, looking at the, um, uh, the paragraph B1, where it says that the 7.5% the amount would be reduced by the amount of Class 1A resources procured prior to or by January 1st, 2023. So I don't know what seven and a half percent means in terms of megawatts, but essentially if, if we, if, if seven and a half, just to put a number on it, and these numbers have no bearing in reality whatsoever, just trying to help my brain understand, if seven and a half percent is uh, 10,000 megawatts and we have procured uh, by this date, 7,000 megawatts, then this procurement would only be seeking to fill that 3,000 left over. Is that correct? Correct. And okay. it, just to give you a sense, Representative Cuddy, I mean, it, 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 it depends which resources the PUC would select and none of us can predict what those prices or resources would be in, in a bidding process. But you know, you're probably talking around uh, 300, maybe 400 megawatts. Again, it depends if, if, if the PUC were to select a resource that has a high capacity factor and they're gonna produce a lot more megawatt hours, that number could come down. If it is say grid scale solar, which has a lower capacity factor of probably around 20, 25%, 
then it's probably going to be in that 300 megawatt range, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Thank you. And uh, just to quickly follow up on that. Go ahead, Representative Cuddy. Thank you. So then the, the second part of this then, part two, just says that if, if the first procurement didn't fill whatever that number is, then a second pro procurement can be done just to fill whatever space was not filled in, correct? That's okay. correct. Thank you. Other questions for Jeremy? Seth, did you get all your questions answered? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have not yet received answers to my questions and they were not for Mr. Payne. Okay. Uh, Scott, did you have another question? I did. I thought I'd, I'd step back in case anybody else wanted to step forward, but I do have another one. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Under the alternative compliance um, payment section, the the price for the class two rec is set is capped at fifteen dollars. How did you come to fifteen dollars as a as an amount? Well, I think it was a reflection of where the the class two rec prices are now. Um, historically, they have been considerably lower, and they've started to tick up um, in the last number of months. So this is really a way to acknowledge that those prices are starting to go up, and this is a way to cap it and say let's go no further than fifteen. So this is really just a cost containment mechanism. But what? How well, was the number why 15? 15? Yeah, there, there's no magical number. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not a rec trader, but I think anecdotally, I've been told that the rec prices have been trading for somewhere between 10 and 12 bucks for a little while now. Um, so this was to create a little bit more room, but not too much room. I mean, I think the, the worst outcome here is that we set a, a, an ACP rate that is so low that what ends up happening is competitive electricity suppliers just choose to pay the ACP instead. That's not what we want to have happen. We would much rather have these um, these these payments go to support existing in-state renewables. That makes a lot more sense rather than just sort of putting it into an ACP fund, which I believe the PUC administers, but I, I can't say that off the top of my head. Scott, any further follow-up? Um, yes, actually. So the, the class two recs, and this is, I always get cloudy around recs, are class two recs existing? Are there any new class two recs coming in? Or is are we talking about payments for projects that have already existed and have been receiving for a long time, two to four dollars? And, and in the last sort of four to six months, it's gone up into this 10 to 12 dollar range. What you just said there at the end is correct. This is, I mean, theoretically, you could see some, some new development, but chances are there's not a lot of interest in, in developers uh, investing so that they can become eligible for class two. They're looking for class 1A eligibility. Thank you. So you're, you're really talking about existing hydro um, and, 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 and waste energy facilities that qualify for class two. Those, those are the resources. Representative Grohowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and along those lines of questions from Rep Cuddy, and to your point, Mr. Payne, that this is largely existing hydro, which I'm not sure if any has really been built in my lifetime. <laughs> Seems like it's kind of old and needs to be refurbished um, more than it needs to be paid off with uh, Rex as part of that equation. And the biomass or waste to energy, excuse me, I think also was sort of a similar age. Um, why is it that I just am having trouble understanding why these payments are really necessary or need to be so high because I don't think these facilities are going to shut down um, without this, you know, without these payments because they've already got their original investments probably paid off. It just seems like they're really not worth this much. And I, and I know it's a cap, so hopefully it won't get that high, but sometimes the um, effect of a cap is that people push right up against it because they know that they can. So I'm just, I'm not sure what the question is here, but can you help me reconcile why we should be subsidizing these projects that are already paid off and aren't gonna shut down? I don't think they're gonna shut down without these payments. I don't expect that Brookfield is about to um, close up shop on some of its dam and go through a really expensive decommissioning process because they're not getting a couple bucks um, you know, for their payments. So can you just help me understand why this is even valuable at this point in the lifetime of these facilities? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of what we want to see happen is we want to make sure that these resources don't go away. And so we want to convince them 
that it makes sense to reinvest in these existing facilities. So we want them to extend their lifespan. So I know that there's a couple of examples in recent years where I believe Brookfield has reinvested in a few of their assets based upon where some of the rec revenues were helpful in getting the financing to make that reinvestment. So that's at least a portion of it. You know, can I tell you that it is 99% the most important piece of their, their financial portfolio in terms of do we choose to reinvest in this? No, I can't. But I think it does provide a meaningful revenue stream for them and convinces them to continue investing in those. I mean, I, I think the worst outcome is that we, that, you know, and I can't, Representative Grahowski, I can't honestly tell you definitively, if you take this away, they will be removed. Um, or if you leave them, they won't. But what I can tell you is I, I, I have been told and, and educated many times over the years by a variety of different hydro owners in particular, that these class two re revenues are an important revenue stream for these, for these assets to be able to continue operating. And I actually said something similar to um, the Environment Committee recently. You know, I, I think sometimes people assume that an outfit like Brookfield has the financial capacity to sort of pay for whatever they want because they're a large company. But each one of these individual assets has a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. So, you know, that the the analogy I made in ENR is it's 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 like Dunkin' Donuts, right? Just because the Dunkin' Donuts in Augusta is successful doesn't mean the Dunkin' Donuts in Gardner is going to be successful. So if Gardner is is struggling. The Augusta Dunkin' Donuts doesn't pay for Gardner to work. Gardner just goes away. So that's ultimately what happens. So if there are successful and profitable hydro assets that Brookfield owns in one portfolio, but others that are not, the ones that are not are going to go away. So I think what we're trying to do is just provide a, a clear revenue stream, but also provide a cap so that these costs don't go up. Because we have seen them go up. I mean, that's that's a real legitimate concern. We should make sure that we are capping these costs so that they don't get out of control. Uh, and so that's what this is intended to do. Because historically, you all have per, you have placed an ACP rate in place for class 1A and class 1, but there hasn't been one for class 2. So this seems, given what we've seen in terms of upward pressure on the pricing, this seems an appropriate moment to apply one. Thank you, Jeremy. Other questions for Jeremy? I don't see any. Um, and I'm looking to see if Melissa has joined us to see if the GEO wants to weigh in on this. You can beam Jeremy back across. Actually, um, Senator, Senator Lawrence, if I may. Oh, you have you... another question. Okay, go ahead, Seth. I, I do, thank you. Is this um, for Jeremy? It, it is, and I'm just noting, okay, Jeremy. Just noting that um, James Bass appears not to be in attendance. So I'll direct this to you, Mr. Payne. The um, question that I had posed to James Bass at the hearing on the bill was about re-energy. Um, are they currently able to sell into markets outside of Maine, such as New Brunswick um, or other parts of New England and take advantage of incentives such as this bill would provide long-term contracts or other uh, procurement, enhanced procurement benefits? Or would, is that just a Maine thing? Um, the short, I, I don't know anything about the requirements uh, in New Brunswick, so I'd have to get back to you on that, Representative. I mean, I, it's a little difficult to say because some of the regulations in Massachusetts and Connecticut have changed in recent years about their treatment of biomass. So the short answer is I don't know off the top of my head. I'd be happy to get back to you. I mean, I will say that there's nothing in the amended version of LD 1350 that will, would allow for existing biomass to bid for contracts. This would only be for new resources that are not yet built. And a follow up, if I may. Go so ahead, Representative Barry. So, um, and two two things. Am I correct that there is, due to those changes you referenced, there's no state that's doing procurements around biomass um, outside of Maine uh, that we're aware of? And I'll reserve my second question, I guess, just to. I, I suspect you may be correct, Representative mm -hmm. Barry, but I will say. Well, actually, no, I think New Hampshire did a contract about two years ago. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think what it also reflects is you're not exactly talking about deeply forested states in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts. I think the fact that we've been open minded about biomass rep reflects the fact that the forest products industry is a very important part of our economy. Um, you know, when you start talking about smaller areas, uh, smaller states, um, particularly areas that are already developed, there's just not forested areas like we have here. I mean, being the most forested state in the country, I think it represents a different dynamic. But I'd be happy to take a look into that and, and get you some specific answers because I don't know 100%. Thank you. And finally, the uh, 
question about uh, biomass bidding into this. You, you mentioned existing biomass would not, and that makes sense. Is it conceivable that new biomass might? I guess so. I mean, I think what we have seen historically, though, is that new biomass doesn't exist um, primarily because the cost structure is, is prohibitive between the cost of wood, the cost of diesel to deliver it to um, to a biomass facility and the electricity prices it, it would need to be viable. It hasn't been able to compete historically with with new wind and solar. That's just the, the reality that we've seen for geez, at least a decade now. Thank you. Great, other questions for uh, Jeremy Payne before we beam him back across? I do not see any, so Jason, if you could beam him back across, and I don't know if you brought Melissa Winnie over yet? Uh, yes, she's here. Okay, Melissa, or, or Dan, um, I just ask you if either of you wanted to um, chime in and uh, add any comments on this proposed amendment. Thanks, Senator Lawrence. I'm Dan Burgess, Director of the Governor's Energy Office. And um, apologies, but I have um, um, another commitment I have to make in, in 10 minutes. So if Melissa can stay with you, if you have uh, more questions after that. Um, and I think just generally uh, what was covered that if um, the way that I think it's structured, if there's going to be additional procurements, as, as, as uh, has been mentioned, that taking into account the procurements that have already happened, I think make, make a lot of sense. You've got the Northern Maine procurement from LD 1710, and that, um, you know, uh, allowing for that to play out also um, and, and making the, the total amount that could be procured based on that, I think makes sense. I did notice maybe a, a technical change that would be needed in the, in the procurement uh, and of the drafting of that, making sure that it's contingent, not just on 3210, but 3210I, which is the Northern Maine section. Um, but that had been the thinking and, and reviewing or in reviewing Senator Vitelli's language um, and happy to take questions. Sorry, I got kicked off Zoom. So if there are other questions, let me know. Great. If there are questions for our, Mr. Burgess, if we could ask them because he has to head away in a couple of minutes. So other questions for Dan right now? I don't, oh, Representative Barry. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, there was a question from the analysis that I had <clears throat> posed to the GEO. Um, there were some recommendations from CMP for cost recovery provisions. And um, forgive me if you just spoke to that, but I just wanted to make sure we captured your, your perspective on that testimony. Dan? Uh, thanks, Representative Barry. Um, I do not recall that testimony specifically, but I don't, that's not included in this language to my knowledge, this is really a kind of a, a taking what worked before and moving that forward. So happy to be corrected, but um, that's my recollection. Representative Barry, any follow-up? No, thank you. Any other questions for uh, Director Burgess while we have him here? Seth, is your hand still up because you have a question or are you all done? It's still up because I forgot to put it down. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for um, Director Burgess? Dan, thank you for coming. And I know you're working on the language on the other bill. Um, so I appreciate the fact that when we're busy, you're very busy. So thank you for taking the time to join us. And Melissa, if you could just, uh, we'll have Melissa go back over to the waiting room, but just hang around uh, in case there are any further questions uh, for the governor's energy office. Okay, so we've heard from uh, the sponsor of the amendment. We've heard from uh, Jeremy Payne and the GEO on this amendment. Um, is there any uh, preference on what to do with this amendment? Representative Cuddy. I actually had wanted to have, um, I had a question about um, cost containment. The PUC and um, the OPA have both uh, come before this committee and talked about the difficulty of tariff rate and, and what we are doing moving forward. And I wanted, to, I wanted to know how this interplays with that, but I'm not certain who is the right party to, to bring forward. I see that Mr. Harwood is here. I see that Ms. Schneider is here, but I don't know to whom to direct the question, I guess. 
Well, my suggestion is, Scott, maybe we bring uh, Bill Hardwood over um, and maybe he can uh, at least help to start the answer to your question. Thank you. So if you could bring uh, the public advocate over, please, Jason, and we'll see if he can begin to answer that question. And I, I don't think I stated it particularly well, so I'm happy to restate it when he gets here if you would like to. Thank you. I followed it completely, Scott. Hey, Bill, uh, when you get on, if you could come online and if you need me to have um, Scott repeat his question, I can. No, good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Uh, we don't have any video yet. Oops, maybe we do. So, uh, we do now. Thank you, Representative you Cuddy. Uh, as members of the committee know, I have expressed concerns about the net energy billing program and the uh, burden on ratepayers if we are looking at paying rates for solar power in the range of 20 cents a kilowatt hour. The good news here is this is more competitive bidding. And we understand that through competitive bidding, we can get solar energy for around five cents a kilowatt hour. That's a much better deal for ratepayers. So I support this. I think the issue here is quantity more than price. And I think by bringing it down to seven and a half percent of total load, that is a, a step in the right direction. We're just trying to gauge how much of the procurement between Northern Maine offshore wind and this program uh, we can absorb, but the price looks, uh, the, the price should be good for ratepayers. So it really, so this does address that concern. Representative Cuddy, does that answer your question? It does, thank you very much, Mr. Harwood. Okay. And then other questions, Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Public Advocate Howard, for being here. Uh, along that same line, uh, we've heard a bit about, with this bill, about uh, potential for biomass, hydro. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on where you would see successful bidders coming from, what type of uh, energy uh, generation uh, we, would we be looking at? And also, uh, part two of my question, are you comfortable with the $15 cap, which as I understand it, that's what it is. I haven't had a short time to look at this amendment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'm qualified to guess who's going to bid on this. I, I know that existing hydro and biomass have been somewhat more controversial than wind and solar. And so I think we need to be careful as we evaluate those uh, potential, uh, but uh, they're welcome to bid. And uh, if we can get uh, low cost energy into the uh, system for those for customers with those um, that's that make that's good for ratepayers. Um, with respect to the class two recs, um, I think the fifteen dollars is a good step in the right direction. We heard anecdotally that those class two recs were bid up uh, in the last year. We're not quite sure why, but the prices seem to be um, out of line <clears throat> with what past behavior. So I think putting a, um, uh, a cap on those, an ACP cap is appropriate. Whether $15 is the right number or not is hard to say, but it's better than nothing. And let's see how it does. And if we need to come back and tweak it, um, I do uh, respect uh, Representative Grahowski's question as to, you know, maybe down the road, we should revisit the whole question of class two recs and whether the existing hydro projects really need this additional um, financial incentive. But I think at this point, um, we support the $15 cap on the class two recs. Thank Does you. Does that answer your question, uh, Steve? Okay. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. <clears throat> yeah, hi, can I? I'd like to hear from uh, Steve Hudson because uh, the IECG were opponents before. I'd just like to have them react to this amendment. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, um, uh, Public Advocate Harwood. And if you could just uh, beam him back across um, to the uh, waiting room and if you could hang out, Bill, there for a while if you can in case we have additional questions for you. And if you could bring Jason, uh, Mr. Hudson across for a question. Okay, he's on his way over. Thank you, Jason.
Okay, um, can you propose your question, Nathan? Yeah, just uh, IECG were one of the two opponents originally to the bill. So I'd just like to hear from the IECG on, on the amendment here and see what their reaction is. Okay, I'll recognize Mr. Hudson and ask him to, if he has a response to that question. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Lawrence. Uh, for those listening online, I'm Stephen Hudson. I'm an attorney with Pretty Flaherty, and I'm here today on behalf of the Industrial Energy Consumer Group. Um, th thank you, uh, Representative Wadsworth, for your question. Uh, we just got a copy of the amendment this morning when it was sent out uh, to the interested parties list, so we haven't fully completed our analysis of it. Um, but we do, and we do uh, understand that this represents uh, a scaling back of the original bill to some degree. Um, but but our, our concerns that were expressed in our uh, testimony originally on the bill still remain uh, in the sense of making sure that we target our further investments uh, to help us uh, um, specifically achieve our uh, the climate goals of transition uh, to heat pumps and, and uh, uh, EV is an, and EV infrastructure. And, and we don't necessarily see that linkage here. But I do want to talk really specifically about the idea of a class two um, uh, alternative compliance payment, um, which we've never had. And um, we've looked at REC data all the way back to 2013, uh, up from 2013 to about uh, the passage of LD 1494, um, those costs never went above um, $2 unless it was for literally uh, a day or a month. Um, and suddenly, uh, in 2021, they started rising very rapidly, uh, which um, OPA Harwood, um, uh, Public Advocate Harwood referred to. And uh, they're currently, uh, according to the numbers we see, trading at around $11 per megawatt hour. Um, the, the, setting the ACP, at, setting any ACP for this uh, potentially um, uh, locks in prices for ratepayers. We're not sure that's the right thing to do. I think Rep Representative Grahowski had some good thinking along those lines. We have members that generate and can sell class two recs. I want to make that clear, but um, I'm not sure that, um, that that if you're going to set an ACP, that you think about looking at the, at the historical numbers as opposed to just what ha what's happened in the last year. There could be many reasons. We understand anecdotally uh, that uh, at least one in, uh, at least one organization has complained to the PUC alleging um, some. Uh, price fixing or attempt to control uh, uh, prices of main recs, including class twos. We'd hate to see if that behavior is in fact occurring. We'd hate to see that locked into statute at a price that might hurt rate payers. Uh, I would also note that um, many of these existing uh, renewables uh, um, to, to Representative Grahowski's point are gonna continue to operate whether there's an ACP or not. Um, I think the question might be if you're gonna set an ACP you might want to set it somewhere closer to the historical number versus uh, the most recent. And I actually have a graph, but I know that this is not a public hearing. I'm glad to share it with any legislator that'd like to see it, uh, that it illustrates what I've talked about. Um, I thought the GEO made an important point. And I, I'm not sure I understand it completely about the additional comp, um, competitive solicitation um, that was targeted for seven and a half percent. Um, it, but that is to be reduced by the amount of class 1A resources procured pursuant to section 3210. Uh, and it's not clear to me whether that's all of 3210, including 3210G and I, or just I. Um, I think that it, in that case, um, uh, it, it ought to be as broad as, uh, as possible so that in fact, if we're able to secure some of those low costs in order to make renewables, that we reduce our, our subsequent purchases um, significantly. Um, my numbers indicate that that might result if, if we get the kind of uh, uptake on 1710 from last session uh, that, uh, that is contain potentially contained within the bill, you might see the, this solicitation um, be zero instead of 7.5%. But I'd, I'd like to hear from those who put this together as to whether that, in fact, could, could be the case. Um, the... Um, we also think that there's some language, there are some language issues that I'm sure you're very competent um, uh, between OPLA and uh, the revisor's office might be caught. We're not sure what give, giving special consideration uh, regarding storage systems means. 
Um, I'm guessing that the commission is going to have to decide what that means. So folks might want to ask them what they think it means before you uh, pass it into legislation. Um, and uh, uh, and I, you know, we, we, we do think that, that uh, the PFAS language is, is intriguing and maybe valuable. So, so we're, not, um, we're not against that piece of it for sure. And I'm glad to answer any of the questions. Um, I apologize for, for kind of running through the bill in a little bit of a haphazard fashion, but, I, but Senator Lawrence, I did try to focus on uh, what we thought, what we saw immediately as things were commenting on. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dodson. As always, you present a lot of good information for us to consider. Representative Wadsworth, um, do you have any follow-up question for Mr. Hudson? I don't see any. Are there any other questions while we have uh, Rep Mr. Hudson over here that committee members would like to ask him? Representative Barry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Hudson, I appreciate your um, remarks and um, I know you're still looking at it, but the, the storage piece uh, caught my eye as well. And I just wanted to understand uh, a little bit better um, how the how, how in your view um we should proceed in order to procure more you know dispatchable resources resources that can um be available when we most need it is this is is there a way to make this bill better to to achieve that goal um what's what's the best way forward from your, from ICG's perspective. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Representative Barry. I'll try to address that. And thank you for asking the question because I did want, to, there was a point I wanted to touch on with regard to storage. Um, first off, we support storage. We think storage is gonna be important, especially as, as I think everyone on this committee is aware, and certainly many of those listening, um, as, you have, as you are more reliant on intermittent but valuable renewable resources that, that you want to incre uh, increase your storage capability. We see that as occurring already. Um, I, you know, uh, there's a lot of storage activity going on in Maine that, uh, I, that we're aware of, um, uh, and and we we're not all of this is none of this has occurred with any kind of um, subsidy or or uh, specific government procurement program. So um, we think that this tent is going to be an organic thing, especially because in order to maintain the grid and in order to um, for these resources to get their uh, a full a full monetization, they're going to need storage um, in order to, to make that happen. So um, again, we think that that's a, a cautionary tale on it. I did want to note that in in uh, the amendment in D one B on uh, with, with uh, so page four or five, there's a discussion about utilizing uh, storage that are in a different location from the class one A resource. Um, and, and using a methodology, it, it, but it's it's not the the test is whether it uh, results in a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Well, we currently have a a um, a grid that is you know about fifty percent. I mean, just the grid is about fifty percent renewable, and it, it, to get a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions would mean that all you need to do is take a slightly a slight increment above that, what the grid level is, maybe 51%. So you could so, add of your usage uh, coming from renewable resources, and then you could charge the rest off of grid resources. So we're not, so all we're getting is that little tiny sliver of increment, and it meets the test of a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So the, I think the committee should consider whether that's enough of a test to warrant inclusion, uh, even though we would suggest that you don't even need to have a program. We think that storage is gonna occur organically um, as we continue to shift to solar and wind and offshore wind. Thank you, um, Mr. Hudson. Let me make sure I'm unmuted. Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, so where we are at on time frame, we're gonna to try to finish up with questions for Mr. Hudson and then beam him back across. Then we'll be taking our break. We'll continue uh, to explore any questions the committee might have and then I'd be happy to entertain a motion at any time on, uh, on this bill. So Representative Cuddy, do you have a question for Mr. Hudson? 
I do. Thank you, Senator. Um, thank you, Mr. Hudson, for everything you brought forward today. And you uh, were discussing the historical price of class two recs, and it sounded like you put them in the sort of two to four dollar range, and that only in the last uh, sh relatively short period of time have they gone up to or exceeded 10. Um, so when when you're trying to find you know a way we're gonna we're gonna have to try to find a way if we're gonna go with an alternative um, compliance payment method we got to find a way to set a price that makes sense and it sounds like your suggestion is that what makes sense is an historical price at which these these um, folks have already been operating and one would assume operating profitably with a, a two to four dollar um, rack as opposed to what they are currently getting it at a 10 to $12. It, it, did I take your suggestion correctly? Thank you very much for your question, uh, Representative Cuddy. I, yes, I mean, I think we have, um, because we think both, both that that reduces the exposure of ratepayers, but it also reflects that historically, it, it, just for the um, committee's benefit, Maine had such an abundance of class two recs that, that only the very largest, um, uh, creator of class two Rex actually marketed them because there, there were just so many, they were trading at, you know, 25 cents per megawatt hour. And they were in, and they, they provoke for those very, for that very large, for those very largest users, that was a revenue stream. And, and so it, it was uh, helpful, but, you know, many of those um, revenue streams are, are re resources that are going to run regardless because of the nature of their operations or their, and the, in fact, when we talked about biomass, many of those are a combined heat and power biomass facilities so that, you know, they rely on the value of their heat energy uh, and the use of that in their industrial processes to lower the cost of their um, overall energy picture. And so that's, um, that's an important part to understand how they can compete uh, with solar and, and with wind resources. But um, but otherwise, I would agree with uh, Mr. Payne that you typically see, if you're talking about new biomass, uh, you might be talking about a cost for the standalone biomass plants. I'd always been told historically the cost for standalone biomass without CHP was about eight cents, eight and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So that's difficult to compete with a grid scale solar, clearly. Um, but, okay. but I think you look at, and by the way, my, my number was, uh, but from 2013 to 2020, I think that I think the average was well below two dollars. And I'm, as I said, I'm happy to send to to the committee's analysts the uh, chart that one of my partners put together on on those those numbers as he's been tracking them. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hudson, for that answer. Representative Cuddy, are you all set on your question for for uh, Mr. Hudson? I am. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Senator Vitelli, you had a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a question for Mr. Hudson. I appreciate his having been here this morning. I understand we'll be taking a break. So what I would ask is that after break, we bring Melissa Winnie over, and I do have some questions for her. Okay, great. Uh, Representative Kessler, do you have a question for uh, Mr. Hudson? Yes, I do. Uh, two questions. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Steve. Uh, so my first question is, do you think that this is, uh, this is purely being driven essentially by increase in um, natural gas prices? And, and so uh, these other resources are simply just, uh, you know, getting what the market will bear. Um, in, in terms of uh, rec pricing, is that what, uh, yeah. Representative Kessler? Is that what you're yeah. referring to? Um, yeah. it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, we've discussed it internally in my firm um, and, and like uh, public advocate Harwood and, and I think probably the PUC, uh, we're still scratching our heads on it. It's possible that it's an appetite for decarbonization. Um, you know, we have seen uh, an increased usage of what I call junk recs. And that may be some people may be upset by that, but they're usually found in other uh, in other states, and they are not they don't meet the the more stringent requirements of Maine's RPS requirement. We've seen them used to tell people, "Oh, we will give you these, and you can um, you you can be comfortable you using renewable energy." Um, and that may be technically true, but it, but they're not recs that meet Maine's requirements for what 
is a wreck. Now, with regard to class twos and, and class ones and one A's in Maine, that's not the case. But we also think there may be an effort, uh, people anticipating that there is going to be an appetite for um, decarbonizing their uh, electricity usage by buying wrecks and holding, well, buying wrecks and holding them and then selling them down the road um, at a profit, similar to the way uh, a hedge fund or others might operate. Um, and I don't know that that is, was necessarily the purpose. The purpose, I think, of the REC program was to support the, the establishment of, um, of new generation and, and that we also wanted to preserve in the class, of class, class twos our existing resources that are already, were already renewable and an important part of our energy picture. I don't think it was our intention to, to uh, uh, enrich uh, REC traders. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Uh, Representative Kessler, you said you had a second question. Yeah, um, thank you. So um, just in terms of, you know, getting new um, grid scale renewables online, you know, we've been considering other ways to do that this session. <clears throat> in particular, I'm thinking of the main generation authority bill. And I'm just wondering, you know, looking at this, looking at what else we've been uh, reviewing, um, do you think that this is the most economically efficient way to get more grid scale renewables online? Well, you see, you, you, your use of the, of the adjective uh, economically, uh, I can't remember what you use, but, but you, you're applying an economic test, most cost effective test. Um, I, I think there's it, it may be questions about that. Certainly a competitive solicitation is better, one, better than one that's not competitive. Um, and uh, certainly going grid scale as opposed to um, small distributed um, allows you to take advantages of, of uh, the economy's scale of grid scale. So that's also good. You know, we have previously testified to our preference in many cases for grid scale procurement over, over distributed. We, we, we certainly recognize that distributed plays a role. We just think it's a, it's a more targeted role than it's been used to date in Maine. Now, the, the other question is, is, could we achieve that either through, for example, having a publicly financed authority uh, secure those, whether it's owning it outright or financing it as opposed to uh, having developers go to commercial banks and, and pay commercial rates that they're going to need to seek recovery on in excess on. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, a, a one way of doing it. Um, you know, another way of, of doing it, um, maybe to see if, um, you know, currently the only requirement for a standard offer provider is, or any competitive electricity provider is to meet the RPS. There's not a requirement for them to go out and, and pr procure renewable energy themselves. And that may be one way of shifting costs from ratepayers uh, to folks that are actually consuming the energy. But that's that's a that's a probably a discussion for another day. I'm sorry that I can't provide a definitive answer to you, um, but I also think that Maine has procured a lot of different size, different scale. We've got uh, multiple RFPs going. We have a research array underway for for offshore wind, which is going to be critical, and which, by the way. Um, has, the, the, uh, at least with regard to solar and wind, the highest capacity factor that I'm aware of. Um, so which makes it a, a valuable resource. On the other hand, you're gonna, you're gonna you, uh, because it will, you can rely on the production so that, the, so hopefully you can get it ultimately at a cost that is uh, grid competitive. But um, we, I, I guess my advice would be to be pretty careful about buying too much too soon. Um, we bought a lot. We haven't yet seen the full shake out of that, and um, and you know we'd recommend that you be very aware of what you have already committed to, and that uh, and that you thinking about the future um, of, of procurement. I know Mr. Payne referenced leaving room for, for offshore wind and and uh, development of other renewables, but I think um, you know we might one thing the committee might consider is at least pushing. Uh, this next phase of procurement, if you intend to go forward with it, think about pushing the next phase of procurement out more years out um, so that you have time to rethink your position if necessary, or to give the PUC the authority to decide not to, not to pursue any procurement if, if they deem it's not in the public interest. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. Are there uh, questions from members of the committee for Mr. Hudson? Okay, Jason, if you could beam him back uh, across. 
Um, Lindsay, you wanted to add in one thing uh, regarding what um, Director Burgess brought up, I believe it was about a technical change before we break. Correct, yes, Director Burgess mentioned this and also Mr. Hudson. Um, in paragraph B1B, uh, there was a, um, a letter got dropped. So when we talk about the offset, the reduction by the amount of class 1A resources procured pursuant to its section 3210-I. So it's the I that got dropped off. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that and that will absolutely be corrected. Great, thank you. So let's take our morning break now. When we come back, we'll see if uh, members of the committee have questions for anybody else um, who is, may be in the waiting room. And then we'll entertain any motions on this bill and determine what we're going to do with the, uh, with the bill. So if you could um, uh, turn off your video and mute yourself and we'll be back. I'm looking at the time. It is uh, approximately 10.35. So we'll be back at uh, 10.50. Thank you.
Okay, we are back live with the EUT committee. Um, we are after our morning break and we are going to be resuming with LD 1350, an act to expand Maine's clean energy economy. Um, it's a bill sponsored by Senator Vitelli and there is an amendment um, which um, Senator Vitelli has been prepared, which is reviewed by the committee. And I'll just ask the committee if there's anybody else before we go into motions and debate or discussion that they wanna hear from uh, regarding um, this uh, amendment. Representative Foster. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, for uh, someone from the PUC. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Do we have anybody from the PUC here? Uh, we have Deirdre and um, Mitch Tannenbaum. Okay. So I'd ask you to bring them both across so Representative Foster can pose his question. And I'm assuming, Deirdre, that you would want Mitch to uh, be the person responding to the question. So I'll go directly to him first. Mitch, let me know when you're on. I'm here. Okay, Mitch, uh, thank right. you. Um, so we'll go ahead, Representative Foster, you wanted to pose a question uh, yes, to someone you. from the PUC. Go ahead, Representative Foster. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, in, in the earlier PUC testimony on this bill, I guess about a year ago, uh, concern was raised about the uh, length of the contracts uh, with the way things are going, we're going back then. And now I consider it's probably even more concerning and also the cost of ratepayers. And I'm wondering, does the PUC have some idea with this amended language, uh, what you might be looking at uh, for added cost to ratepayers? Hey Mitch, why don't you introduce yourself and um, see if you can answer that question. Uh, good morning. My name is Mitch Tannenbaum. I'm senior counsel at the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, it's difficult to predict what the costs or benefits might be of a, of a, of a procurement. Um, as you're aware, some, we have done procurements where the pricing was very favorable. Um, I'm not sure there's anything that may well be in the amendment an amended version that would allow the commission to reject all bids if it found um, that they were not in the public interest. Um, you know, sometimes these procurements intentionally allow for above market prices. Um, I'm not sure that's the intent with with this with the amendment of this bill. Um, that maybe could be clarified. As as far as the length of time, it's generally um, our understanding that a 20 year contract is often necessary for a project to obtain financing on favorable terms. Of course, the longer the contract, the more risk. Um, so, you know, what's important to understand is anytime you do a long term contract, in essence, it's a reallocation of risk. So instead of the developer having the risk of market fluctuations, the ratepayers have that risk. And in return, the project can get financing on favorable terms. Um, hope, hopefully that helps, Representative. Any follow-up, Representative Foster? Yes, if possible, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, there is an answer to this. I think you gave it in that. My next question was, does, would, does this amendment offer the PUC the opportunity to turn down bids if, if they come in too high? And I think, Mr. Tannenbaum, you said that you're not sure of that yet. Is that correct? I'm not. Deidre, maybe Deidre has a better feel for the language. You know, when you, when you start digging into a, a bill that's got all these red lines, it's really hard to follow. Yeah, I'm not that sure at this point. I'm still trying to wade through it a little bit. Thank you, Deirdre. Any further questions, uh, Representative Foster for the PUC? 
Uh, one last one, if I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. I'm, I, I, I'm guessing you can't answer this, but uh, maybe you have some thoughts from previous uh, uh, bids that have been put out. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what type of generation we would be looking at being successful in bidding for these uh, contracts? Thank you. Uh, well, of course, it's hard to say, uh, but in, in the past, most of the bids we accepted was solar, so I don't particularly see any reason why that would change, but there, there might be others in the audience that have a better feel for that. Thank you. Any other questions for the PUC while we have them over here? Okay, I do not see any. Um, oops, I apologize. Um, Senator Vitelli, is your question for the PUC? Sorry, Mr. Chair. No, I'm still waiting to pose my question to um, Melissa Winnie from the GEO office. That's what I thought. Thank you. Um, Representative Barry, you have a question for the PUC? I do. Um, and I apologize if I missed this. Uh, just coming back. So uh, just let me know if so. And I'll catch up. The question was about the, the storage language and how you would interpret uh, the, the language in the sponsor's amendment around um, special consideration, I think might be the phrase for storage. That hasn't been asked yet, Representative Barry. So um, Mitch, if you could see if you could answer that for the committee. I'm not sure what that language would mean i mean you know if the if the law was passed the commission would interpret it but off the top of my head I'm not not sure how that would be interpreted representative barry any follow-up i guess not thank you okay any other questions for the puc thank you both for coming over um and um answering our questions. We'll ask Melissa Winnie to come across. Uh, Senator Vitelli has a question. She should be on her way over. Thank you, Jason. I was just checking. Melissa, um, Senator Vitelli has a question for you. Why don't you go ahead, uh, Senator Vitelli, with your question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Melissa, for being with us uh, again today. I have two questions for you. One, I'm wondering if you could just sort of go over again the way this procurement um, bill fits in with the broader GEO's goals for um, renewable energy procurement over a period of time and how you see this is helping to balance that out with the targeting on new um, class 1A applicants. And then my second question is with whether or not the GEO would be comfortable with an ACP for class two recs at $10 as opposed to what's in the bill at 15 currently. So those two questions, one sort of bigger picture and one more detailed, if you could, please. Melissa, why don't you go ahead and see if you can answer those questions? Yes, thank you, Senator Vitelli. Um, and again, I'm Melissa Winnie, Energy Policy Advisor in the Governor's Energy Office. Um, to your first question, you know, we have conducted modeling, um, you know, both through as we've talked about previously, both through the Maine Climate Council uh, and through our RPS study that the Governor's Energy Office did, um, looking at what is going to be needed in order to continue to meet our clean energy goals, including the, the RPS. Um, and it's, it's clear that we are going to need to bring additional resources online, particularly as the state pursues strategies like beneficial electrification um, in order to meet our climate and greenhouse gas reduction targets, 
that will lead to a, an increase in load um, that we will need to meet in the state uh, through additional, again, additional generation. And so, you know, this procurement, particu particularly being structured in a way that it's taking into consideration what the outcome of the Northern Maine procurement is. Uh, both continues to advance our goals and need for additional new renewable energy generation to come online um, in a way that's really kind of considering both our need for uh, additional generation to meet our load and not doing it too quickly or imprudently. So, you know, making sure that if the procurement goes through for Northern Maine, continue to analyze what our need will be moving forward. So I think it's a, a great balance of um, recognizing kind of some of the uncertainty, but that we need to keep growing the industry and keep bringing new resources online. Um, to your second question of the ACP at $10, um, <clears throat> I think it's important to understand that there's a bit of, of volatility in terms of kind of what the rec market does um, we have had a number of conversations with the industry that uh, gave us kind of an expectation that the long range price here would be around seven to ten dollars. Um, and so when we're we're looking at an ACP, uh, you know, priced slightly above that range, you know, we would be comfortable, I think, with maybe twelve dollars. Um, but you know, I understand uh, wanting to bring it below the $15 price that's currently in there. Um, one other piece that I did want to mention that we had talked about maybe including here is that within 3210, um, number 11, there is direction for a report um, to study class 1A resources and the, and the RPS. And we had uh, talked about maybe directing that to the GEO in consultation with the PUC and moving the date of that up. It's currently March 31st, 2024. Um, we may suggest moving that to March 31st, 2023, which would give our office an opportunity to do some additional analysis looking at rec markets and the RPS um, that could help inform kind of this discussion moving forward. Thank you very much, Melissa. Are there other questions for Melissa Winnie from the GEO? Representative Barry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Winnie, um, appreciate your uh, ideas here, the GEO ideas. I wondered if you could um, play it out for me. You, you mentioned that in order to meet our, our um, renewable energy goals that, that we need to do some procurement like this um, what would be the harm, just for the sake of argument, in allowing our RPS procurements to do that job for us? Thank you, Representative. I'm not sure I, I completely understand your question. Are you talking that in comparison to the Northern Maine procurement that was passed or... Sorry, no, the, uh, the question really is about the RPS. We passed in, in a bill actually also by Senator Vitelli um, a few years ago, as you recall, um, measures to get us to our goals uh, around renewables by 2030 to 80% and then by 2050, although it's a bit less specified uh, to 100%. So is it, it when, when you say that this, that a procurement like this is necessary, how does it assist us in meeting those goals that can, that would otherwise be procured through RECs? Or to put it differently, could we not just uh, make sure that in procurements by, you know, through the standard offer process or in requirements for CEPs that, that we are meeting our climate goals as currently required in statute. Do, do you, you follow the question now, Melissa? I think I do, yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a number of components that you're asking about here. We've got, you know, the REC needs to meet our RPS. Um, 
you know, I think it's important to recognize that our neighboring New England states also have their own climate and clean energy goals that are going to require, you know, additional recs in order for them to meet, meet their targets as well. Um, there's benefits to making sure that we're procuring our own in-state generation beyond just the RPS compliance. So in our RPS study, we did find that, you know, we will need additional in-state generation online um, in order to continue to meet our, again, our load growth, but also, um, you know, allow for the ability of those recs to participate in, in our own RPS compliance needs as well. Um, you know, we've seen through similar procurements in the structure, really highly competitive prices um, come through through the PUC procurements for the tranche one and tranche two that were um, done in the last couple of years. And so, you know, I think we've seen the success of this structure of procurement uh, and also, you know, not directly related to your question, but, you know, there are additional economic benefits that come from the development of these projects. And within the procurement structure, we've we've worked to ensure that, you know, those are, are guaranteed um, benefits that are included in the contract agreement. So I hope that starts to get at your question. Um, I think there's there's a lot of really complicated components to that. Senator Barry, any follow-up questions? Uh, nope, I think that does it, thank you. Okay, Representative Foster, a question for Melissa Winnie. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Winnie, for being here and uh, hopefully answering this question. In your language or in the language in section B1, uh, the commission shall procure energy or in, in the uh, subsection one, it says the commission shall initiate a competitive and ensure that sol solicitation results in the approval of contracts. Does that language tell me that the PUC will not have the ability to deny contracts uh, based on bids that they receive in, in ultimately? Is that what that basically says? Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foster, for the question. And I know that this was posed to the PUC, um, but in terms of their interpretation of that and how this fits into the existing statute, I would really prefer to lean on, on the PUC to answer how they would interpret the language and what that would mean for their procurement structure. Any follow-up, Representative Foster? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, only if the PUC is, uh, has a chance to look at that and, and maybe answer the question, but thank you. So after we're done with uh, Ms. Winnie, do you want the PUC back over? Uh, yes, if there's someone that can look at that in the meantime and see what they think, thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Grohowski, a question from Melissa Winnie. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one thing I'm trying to wrap my head around is that this bill is, you know, inserting a new procurement into statute that's about a procurements that have already happened and contracts are already, as I understand it, you know, agreed upon. And so there's some language in here, like uh, in the section on procurements in C, where the weighting is happening, 70% to ratepayers, 30% to benefits the economy. I'm uh, just trying to understand if, does the GO think that these benefits to the economy are still relevant to include in this bill? And I'm asking that because as I recalled when we had 1494 in the previous legislature, this was part of a big compromise that happened between a lot of stakeholders um, as we were sort of re-energizing this program. And I think that, you know, A had to do with hydro resources that now have a contract through the PUC. B had to do with biomass resources that now have a contract, I think, through the PUC. Um, and so it seems to me like this is sort of unnecessary at this point because those needs were met through the previous two procurements. And so I wonder, maybe I'm missing something. Is there you know, did the GEO give thought to just striking a lot of those because they're really not relevant anymore? And instead, um, you know, I'd like to see with the new language about PFAS, for instance, I think that's a serious problem. Um, and I think I would not want to see hydro moving ahead, you know, above uh, contaminated lands that we can't do anything else with. So I'm just wondering, you know, did you think about getting rid of any of these sort of what I think are maybe obsolete 
pieces of statute um, in favor of newer problems that we're trying to solve? Thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, you know, I definitely am open to the discussion of that. Um, you know, I think our, our thinking was that we saw the success of those previous procurements. And so, you know, kept that language with the addition of the PFAS consideration. Um, I understand your point here, um, you know, and I, again, I think we'd, we'd be open to discussing it, but it wasn't something that we um, had recommended any changes around at this time. Any follow-up, Representative Grahowski? Okay, um, why don't we bring over um, the PUC, uh, bring uh, Mitch Tannenbaum back over and Deirdre back over to answer Representative Foster's questions. See Deirdre, and I don't see Mitch yet, but there he is. Okay, Representative Foster, why don't you pose your question? Well, yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Briefly, I don't know if you heard my question to the GEO, uh, uh, Ms. Winnie, but when I look at this uh, section B, uh, subsection one, I'm wondering if you've had a chance to take a look at that. Uh, she did not suggest that they put that in there for uh, any particular reason, but I'm wondering if you could speak to whether you, at least at this point in time, think that it might prevent the PUC or, uh, or not from uh, denying uh, bids that they find are not acceptable. Thank you. I do think the language is just unclear. <clears throat> So would it mean that if we had already gotten 7.5% of retail sales and or 14%, does that mean we don't have to do any procurement at all because we got that in a previous procurement? Or is this new procurement kind of starting over and has a target of 7.5% of retail load? Or, yeah. Um, so, uh, again, it, it appears to, to us to be somewhat confusing. And if the intent is to, you know, kind of take a break and see where we are after the Northern Maine uh, procurement and after we see the previous procurements, how many of those projects actually come um, to uh, commercial operation. And then the commission takes another look to see if, looks like you know we have seven and a half percent or 14 whatever the goal is and if not then we could do another procurement that might make sense but uh and again Deidre I looked at Deidre for help I, I just find the language just confusing Deidre is there anything you wanted to add in Sure, thank you. Um, Deirdre Schneider, the main PUC. I mean, I do think that that language that you're referencing specifically, Representative Foster, that we have to ensure that the solicitation results in an approved contract um, would say if, you know, if in the Northern Maine procurement, we didn't procure that 7.5% of retail electricity or not, not enough that it would cover that. So we would have to procure some amount that we would be uh, required to enter, direct uh, uh, T&D to enter into a contract even if the prices came in at, at prices that we maybe didn't think were competitive or fair prices. I mean, I think the piece that Mitch is, is talking about is true, that there is an uncertainty there in that, um, you know, we're to procure 7.5% of the retail electricity reduced by any amount procured in that Northern Maine procurement. That piece would have some flexibility or could put a stopgap on a procurement. But if all things considered, we didn't get to that, that level, um, we would be required to direct a contract regardless of the prices submitted in that solicitation. Representative Foster, any follow-up for the PUC? Set, thank you. Questions for the PUC, Representative Grohowski. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think this is a fine question to ask you all. I'm just sort of looking back at the other language based on the question I posed to the governor's energy office. So if in B2, it says that these projects uh, must be class 1A resources that begin commercial operations after June 30th, 2022, does saying something like capital investments to the resource to improve long-term viability of an existing facility even make sense? Or don't those conflict? Like an existing resource wouldn't be able to be something that began commercial operations after June, 2022. Do you agree with that reading? Sorry. It's, the question um, is, do you agree or Deirdre, do you agree with that? Like, am I reading that correctly? <laughs> I mean, it seems to indicate that it would have to be new after that date. And so I think the refer, I mean, I think that would have to be restructured if you're trying to get at different facilities that did updates or upgrades. I, I think you're right. That is in conflict, at least the way I'm understanding it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something and Mitch could, could add in, but that does seem to be in conflict. It, it's uh, under our new... Uh, portfolio requirements, both class one and class one A, has always included refurbished uh, projects, so not brand new projects, but a project that has gone through a substantial refurbishment to qualify. Um, under the same theory that you know we want to uh, you know have an incentive for plants that aren't operating to maybe re refurbish and operate and be considered new. If that helps. <laughs> Representative Gorohowski, a follow up question? Yeah, thank you. My follow up question would be since the Public Utilities Commission has already done the two procurements that this language was specifically designed to address, if we were to edit that section, you know, so it's no longer the law, does that create any problems for those existing contracts? Is it better to create a brand new section for this procurement or is it okay to sort of edit based on the, the next procurement going forward? Does that make sense? Deirdre or Mitch, can you answer that question? I think that would defer to Deirdre, but it does seem confusing. So maybe another section would, would be clearer. Deirdre? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think another section will be clear. The only thing that I do think is a hang up is the backfilling piece. So there's a piece in there that's a second procurement. If we need to backfill from those first set of procurements, any energy, would you, would you want to that to apply in that as being a new procurement? So, I mean, I, I, I don't, or do you want the same rules to apply that you did the first time? Because there's that piece that now we can backfill anything that didn't get built through those first rounds of procurements. So, I mean, I think that would just be a consideration for the committee of do they want that to apply also to the second procurements or kind of keep the rules the same they were the first time around? Any other questions for the PUC? Seeing none, thank you very much, Jason. You can beam them out back across. I'm just gonna ask committee members at this point, is there anyone on the committee that doesn't know where they're going or whether they're likely to support this bill and needs to adapt, ask additional questions of somebody in order to inform their decision. Just raise your hand. Okay, uh, Representative Foster, you're still undecided. You could support this bill. Well, I have one question that may help. But my question for you is, are you undecided or have you made up your decision whether or not you're gonna support this? I can make up my decision, thank you. What's that? I said, I can make my decision, thank no, you. No, I'm asking if you have made your decision. Are you thinking about supporting this bill and you need to find out something else in order to support it? Well, I have one brief question for the sponsor, if I, if I could. Okay, um, go ahead with your question. I'm trying to get questions for people from the audience done first, um, okay. so we can get to the point where we have a motion and debate. But go ahead and pose your question to Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, if I may, the section that's added in regards to PFAS, just want to make sure that uh, that is asking the PUC to uh, consider it and not requiring them to 
uh, utilize that property or land. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Representative Foster. Um, had, had given much thought to that addition to this RPS, to that 30%. Um, and it is, as you stated, it's to give permission for the PUC to consider that as one of the factors uh, under that 30% section. And, and while we're discussing that, let me also say that I think it's been brought up that sections A and B may no longer be relevant. So if we wanted to amend that section, I'd be willing to remove those too, but I think the others are important to continue um, as uh, considerations in somebody's bid under this procurement process. But hopefully I answered your question. Great. And Representative Gorohowski, are you still undecided on this bill and you need to hear from somebody outside of the committee to help inform your decision? Yeah. Okay. I am who very undecided like, on this bill. <laughs> who is it you would like to hear from? Um, I was uh, hoping to hear from uh, Rob Wood of the Nature Conservancy um, with, with some questions I had about, you know, are we looking at PFAS in the best way that we can? Because I really think, I don't know what we're going to do with that land other than put solar on it and put hemp on it. <laughs> so <laughs> and Representative you... Grohowski Jason <clears throat> wants to uh, pose a question. Uh, to someone from the Nature Conservancy. Is there someone from the Nature Conservancy who could come over so Representative Grohowski could pose a question? Jason, do you have somebody to beam across? She had said Rob Wood, um, and he has his hand up. Would you like me to bring him over? Yes, please. She has a question for him. Okay, Representative Grohowski, why don't you go ahead and pose your question? Um, yes, thank you so much. And Mr. Wood, thank you for being here. Um, as I understand it, you know, your organization, the Nature Conservancy, has worked with other organizations that are really concerned about PFAS contaminated lands and what we can best do with them. Question I have for you is, do you think the way that this is structured where that's just one of many considerations and a 30% bucket is going to really help us get those lands into this program uh, or is there something else we should do and, and the reason I'm asking is because in other committees I know that there's a hundred million dollar I think it is proposal to use money to to buy this contaminated land and relocate farmers and it occurs to me that this might be a more affordable way of giving that land value uh, that it otherwise doesn't have for these farmers. And, um, you know, I think it's a question of, is there other land they have they can use, et cetera, et cetera, and, you, you know, particular use case. But I think that this might be a much more affordable way for the state of Maine to help address this. But I wonder if you think it's going to be adequate the way it's drafted. Thank you, Representative Grohowski. So if I understand the question, Mr. Wood, is, is this the best way to um, make use of PFAS land? Well, thank you for the, the question, Representative Gorhowski and, um, and Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, members of the committee. Good to see you this morning. Um, I'm Rob Wood. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Climate Policy for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. Um, and I, I'll just say, first of all, I, um, I, I have um, you know, been in, in touch with um, Senator Vitelli and, and Mr. Payne from MREA um, and others uh, about the PFAS language um, that's in the proposed amendment and just want to say, you know, we um, really ap appreciate the inclusion of language related to PFAS and, um, you know, have said that we enthusiastically, you know, believe that, um, you know, there are, um, you know, currently contaminated lands, lands contaminated by PFAS or otherwise contaminated or previously developed um, lands that, um, you know, could be utilized for solar development that could be beneficial economically and beneficial for the environment. And so I just would like to um, just just um, note that you know we uh, certainly appreciate the inclusion of that language, and I think Representative Grahowski to your to your question about you know is this is it enough to move? I think you know if I may just um, interpret you know your question just you know is it is it enough to kind of move the needle? I'm 
I'm not sure that the the language as drafted is quite enough to kind of move the needle and give give a, a, a significant leg up to um, you know projects that are on PFAS contaminated land or otherwise you know contaminated or previously developed land. I think you know giving the language that gives permission to um, the the commission to um, to consider it um, certainly you know is is, um, is important. However, I think without providing some specific weight to that um, to that criterion um, or um, you know some version of that criterion that might be expanded to include you know other previously developed or contaminated land that I don't think you know our our analysis is that it wouldn't necessarily. Um, you know, move move the needle in a meaningful way. So, you know, we would certainly love to see a little bit more emphasis placed on that, and some additional weight given to projects that are on um, on those on those those lands. Um, to you know, like you said earlier, kind of if, if we're looking ahead as a state to how we can utilize those lands and and what types of projects, what types of renewable energy projects we'd like to see in the future. We think you know, projects on PFAS contaminated land would certainly be um, you know beneficial economic, economically and help avoid impacts to, you know, forest land and, and other, um, you know, other parts of our environment. Thank you uh, for that answer, Mr. Wood. Any further questions from the committee for Mr. Wood? Representative Barry. Thank you. I, I saw uh, Senator Vitelli's hand first. I didn't want to. Nope, I'll let you go first. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Wood, thank you for your comments. Um, the Nature Conservancy is very involved in um, forestry stuff. I, I know that um, you know biomass is something that that you watch. Is this um, the the way it's written now? Could could it end up being um, you know kind of a, a unintentionally uh, perhaps a a subsidy to uh, the refurbishment of a biomass plant. Um, is that where this may be going? You know, I'm looking at 1710. I know that we included language for biomass there. If that ends up not panning out, um, might we inadvertently be sort of putting our, uh, you know, zero carbon hopes in a not so zero carbon basket? Uh, thanks representative for that, that good question. Um, you know, I, I think in the, the context of, of this particular bill, um, given that it is looking toward procuring exclusively new resources, um, you know, I, I think I would go back to, um, you know, a comment that was made earlier. I can't remember who made the comment, but just speaking to the, uh, might have been Mr. Hudson speaking to the specific, you know, price per kilowatt hour that a, a you know, new biomass facility um, would need, need to propose to bid into a, a procurement like this. And I think, you know, in, uh, our understanding is that a, you know a new biomass facility wouldn't uh, likely wouldn't be competitive um, with you know so solar new solar and wind just in terms of price and the way that this procurement is, is structured. I do think that um, you know as uh, Representative Grahowski pointed out earlier, you know there there are some specific provisions in the the current weighting of how the um, commission is required to. Um, evaluate projects with 70% to ratepayer benefits, 30% to economic benefits. In that 30% for economic benefits section, the specific um, criteria that they may consider include provisions like purchase of wood fuel that are really designed to support biomass and that probably wouldn't um, you know, be applicable in this case because the, the purpose of the bill is to procure new resources and, and um, solar grid scale solar and wind are gonna be the most um, price competitive in that scenario. So a follow-up. Senator Barry, any follow-up? Thank you. Uh, so you the, the way you read this is very clear. It has to be absolutely new, brand new, um, or can it be refurbished? <clears throat> I I need to look at the language um, one more time, Representative. Uh, you know, I, I think that the the commercial operation date that's referenced in the bill, I have, again have to look at the specific language. I do think that given the commercial operation date of June 20, I think it was June 2022, um, that would, uh, I think in all likelihood, not allow for a refurbished facility, but I would honestly look to the analysts or, or others to, to provide a, a clearer answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Barry. Are you all set on your question for Mr. Wood? I am. Thank you. I just want to remind people in the, um, 
<clears throat> in the um, non-panelist section, the attendees that the chat function is not to be used for debate or discussion or to try to get information to the committee. It's solely for procedural questions. Um, we are in a work session where we are not, it's not a time for public comment. It's a time for committee members to debate and discuss the bill, decide what they wanna do. Um, we are, we do allow committee members to ask questions of people, if it will help them inform their decision and to make their decision. Uh, Senator Vitelli, you have a question for Mr. Wood? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you were pointing to me. I, I apologize, my internet is unstable. I may have to shut down my video at some point, but um, I'll try to get my question in. Thank you, Mr. Wood, for being here today. I wanna to start by saying, I share the deep concern about the fate of many of our farmers who discovered PFAS is polluting their land and making it essentially unusable for agriculture. I think that's an issue that we've seen sort of permeate uh, conversations in, in a number of our committees. And there are a number of proposals moving forward to try to address that issue and as, it, as rightly it should, because it's a serious issue that affects all of us. Uh, I hear from farmers in my district, for example, who are struggling with the uncertainties that this has brought to them. I think the issue for me, and as I've debated how to incorporate PFAS-affected land into this RPS proposal, is the proximity that a project might have to the interconnection. And that's where the cost regardless of whether it was PFAS land or not, contaminated land, is going to have an impact on the project itself. So I think it's fair to say, and it's why I ended up with the language as you see here, um, that yes, we want to include those kinds of properties in the consideration of where there might be some good economic benefit, if you will, to the uh, location of a new generation facility but it has to make economic sense. And if we're talking about something that is so far removed from, the, from where they can connect with the grid, that it's just gonna raise their costs, that perhaps is not the best use of that property, even though it is PFAS contaminated in this instance. I think, you know, I, I'm really interested in another proposal that's going forward that looks at dual use that may have some ways of, of uh, benefiting farmlands in this instance. Um, but I think, you know, my proposal will be that we remove the first two elements under 30, but keep the PFAS as it is so that it's considered um, as one of the economics under that section of the bill. And I, I'm just hoping that you, um, I guess my question to you is, do you understand um, how that can play out. And the question for you, Mr. Wood, is do you understand how that can play out? Thank you, Senator Vitelli and, and Senator Lawrence. And uh, Senator Vitelli, thank you again for that. I, I, I genuinely um, appreciate that that explanation and the, and the just very thoughtful approach that you, you've taken on this bill and others have taken. Um, and I think I, I do understand the, the um, you know, consideration around if a you know, project that, might be located on PFAS contaminated land, but it might be a little um, farther from the grid interconnection point, um, you know, might need a longer generator lead line, for example, which might increase the cost of the, the project overall. Um, I, I do think that's, um, you know, a reason why we would love to see a little bit broader language that also incorporates, you know, land use considerations uh, more, more broadly and that would give some specific, you know, weight to land use considerations. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that that would be um, worth including in the bill. However, I completely understand where, where you are, and I appreciate that, um, that, ex that explanation and the thoughtful approach. Any other questions from the committee for Mr. Wood? Thank you very much. Is there anybody else, show of hands, of members of the committee who is still undecided on this bill and needs to hear information from somebody else? in order to help them make up their decision.
I don't see any hands. So we're at the point of needing a motion on this bill. I'll recognize uh, Representative Grohowski for the purposes of making a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a lot swirling in my head on this bill and I'm not ready to vote on it now. So I am move the table. Okay, you can't debate a tabling motion. So I'll say that's out of order. Um, Representative Barry. Thank you, I move to table. The move to table, is there a second? Second. Second. I'm sorry, who was the first second? Representative Ziegler. Representative Ziegler. Okay, there's a second. Uh, tabling motions don't have debate or discussion. So I'm gonna ask you a show of hands of how many are in favor of tabling. And I ask you to keep your hands up while I take a count. Show of hands, how many are in favor of tabling? Count one, two, three, four, five. And hopefully Representative Kessler, you're not driving. Um, and show of hands of those opposed. One, Representative Foster, two, three. I'm sorry, Senator Vitelli, are you opposed? Four, five. So the motion is five to five to table, the motion fails. Other motions? We are now in work session on this bill, Senator Vitelli. No, I'd like need... to, it's my bill, but I would like to move uh, to pass with some, oh, with amendments. Okay. Um, so do you wanna go over those amendments first so the person seconding can know what you're suggesting as amendments? I'd be happy to, thank you. The first is to change the ACP to $12 under that section. The other amendment is to remove point A and B under the 30% section C2. And then Lindsay, you had an amendment, a technical amendment as well to add the letter I somewhere. Correction, yes. Thank you. And I think that's all of them. Okay, does everybody understand Senator Vitelli's uh, motion? Is there a second to it? I'll go ahead and second it. Debate or discussion? Sen uh, Representative Cuddy. Thank you. Um, There are uh, a number of, of pieces to this bill. There's a lot going on, so I voted to table initially. But uh, if we're going to move forward and have a vote on this, the, the $12 uh, ACP is, is much higher than I would want to see that. Um, my preference for the ACP is a $5 number. We have been looking at, um, or we're seeing an industry in terms of class two recs that has never had the benefit of a, a five, over $5 rec prior to the last uh, number of months and, and has always succeeded. And the $5 ACP would allow for that revenue stream to continue, uh, but protect ratepayers. And I, uh, $12 essentially as I understand from anecdotal evidence, essentially caps it where it is today. And it's already too high uh, for my liking today. Um, I would ask if um, Senator Vitelli would uh, accept uh, an amendment to change the ACP to $5. I don't know if I have to make that as a motion, but um, I would ask if she would accept that. Senator Vitelli, will you accept that friendly amendment? Uh, thank you, Representative Cuddy. I'm, I'm not prepared to do that at this point. I'm hoping we can have some additional discussion about elements of this 
bill so I can get a better understanding of where people are and what some of the other pieces might need to be um, addressed. Okay, that's, that is certainly uh, one that I would like to see addressed. Thank you. Other debater discussion, uh, Representative Wadsworth. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll be opposing this motion. It, it feels like this bill is like a legislature too early. Uh, the state of Maine sorting through what we're doing with PFAS and just overall general solar siting. Um, I know the Ag Committee just voted to start looking into that. And then, um, you know, with NED and other procurements that we have going on right now, and, and also the class two rec market that's uh, definitely kind of been out of whack. Um, it just feels too early for me. Seems like you should come back on the 131st. <laughs> other debate or discussion? Representative Berry? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree uh, with Representative Wadsworth, and although I'd greatly appreciate uh, the uh, goals of the sponsor, 100% agree with them, and and um, you know others who have worked on the bill. Um, I will be unable to support it at this time. Um, I think that we can do better uh, in order to, to bring down costs, and I'd, I'd like to keep working on that. Thank you, Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am pulled over while speaking here. Um, I, I really do respect uh, the work that Senator Vitelli uh, has done on this bill thus far, but I just don't feel confident uh, that this is going to be in the best interest of ratepayers. Um, my main concerns really are the level of procurements that are underway right now, and I really do think that it's important to see how those play out. Um, and it's not clear to me um, who is really going to see the benefit from this bill. So just as is, I just I don't feel confident enough to support it. So of the debate or discussion. Just looking for a show of hands. Um, Representative Grohowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I'll chime in while people are um, speaking about where they're headed. Um, I do think that there are some great components to this bill. There's parts that, like Representative Cuddy mentioned, uh, you know, with 5% ACP for rec class twos that, or class two recs that I really think we don't have the right information to make decisions about right now and could actually backfire. I just I really want to make sure that the policy we're doing uh, for renewables is at low cost. I think we've learned a lot of lessons. I know I have over the past couple of years and there's things I would do differently. And uh, one of those is um, I want to really get more information from a variety of sources before authorizing uh, another program like this. And so my decision could change in a day or two, but right now I'm just not comfortable with this bill. Um, and I do want this committee to, closely consider um, well-researched and, and um, proven in other jurisdictions models for building grid scale renewables at low cost using public financing, because I think that's where we're gonna see real savings in the order of billions of dollars. For ratepayers, we'll talk about that later today, um, but I think we need to be smart as we move forward and learn lessons. So I'll be voting against this motion right now. Of the debate or discussion, Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Um, and thank you for members of the committee for voicing your concerns with this bill. At this point, even though this bill was held over from last session, um, I would like to move to table. Okay, we can't debate a tabling motion. So um, someone will have to uh, make a tabling motion. Mr. Chair. I don't see any table. Um, Representative Barry. I'm going to move to table. Uh, Representative Barry moves the table. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Representative Ziegler. Show of hands. Please keep your hands up so I can make a count. All those in favor of tabling, please raise your hand. One, two, 
Three, Senator Vitelli. Four, five, six. All those opposed? One, two, three, four opposed. So the motion prevails this time, the bill is tabled. So we are now at 11.50. Uh, we've been at working committee for almost three hours and we've only tabled two bills. I just remind, wanna remind people again about uh, tomorrow's deadline, uh, Friday's deadline and that uh, bills will have to be uh, completed by then, or otherwise leadership is going to begin taking bills out of committee and putting them in the dead file. Okay, we'll now lay before the committee LD, and just so you know the process, my intent is to take our lunch break somewhere between 12.30 and one. We'll be very breaking uh, for about an hour. We'll be back in session. We'll be taking a break sometime mid-afternoon. Then we'll be back in session. If we need to, we'll be taking a break for supper and then we'll be continuing on into the evening. Okay, I'll now uh, lay before the committee uh, LD 1634, an act to create the main generation authority. And I believe we've already had the analysis on this. I know we have, we've had some debate or discussion. So I'll go directly to the um, sponsor of the bill, uh, Representative Grohowski, to see if there are any new amendments uh, that she is offering. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. So we're gonna come back to 1955 that was advertised as going between the two. I'm sorry, I skipped over that one. I apologize. Um, yes, let me go to 1955. Uh, 1955, an act to facilitate net energy uh, generation uh, billing. And I'll go to, have we had an analyst report on this um, yet, uh, Lindsay? Okay. No, the committee has not. Okay, so why don't you do your analyst report and uh, then we'll have questions for you. Okay, bear with me one moment, and I will send out the bill analysis on this 1955. Okay. All right, bear with me one moment, and I will share my screen. Okay, please confirm you're able to see my screen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so this is LD 1955, an act to facilitate net energy billing. Um, there's a public hearing on February 22nd. Uh, this bill establishes various requirements for transmission and distribution utilities to share information, handle billing, and otherwise interact with customers and project sponsors in net energy billing arrangements, including establishing that net energy billing data is the property of the customer, and a TND utility must release that data when directed uh, by the customer to do so in writing. Uh, the bill directs the PUC to establish rules directing a TND utility to provide customers with electronic access to their net energy billing data at no cost to the customer, transmit this data in near real time and no later than seven days to project sponsors, provide confirmation of NEB program acceptance and implementation at no cost to the customer to project sponsors and the customer, synchronize the customer's billing cycle with that of the project sponsor, implement automated billing and crediting procedures, apply NEB credits in a specified order using the oldest unused credits first, um, and apply billing assistance program customer credits as cash, provide project sponsors with specific customer data within seven days after the end of an NEB cycle and provide NEB customers with specific data regarding their credits. Um, the bill establishes that a customer's participation in NEB does not affect their qualification for benefits from energy con conservation or assistance programs administered by Maine State Housing Authority or Efficiency Maine Trust. And the bill requires that the PUC establish a complaint handling process for project sponsor complaints about TND utility compliance um, and provides that the commission may direct the TND utility to pay costs resulting from billing errors. Um, as I said, the public hearing was on the 22nd. And um, the committee heard from proponents who said that the project sponsors need access to customer data for timely and accurate billing, which results in a better customer experience overall and less confusion. Um, the bill is intended to give customers greater access to their own energy use data. Um, opponents and those who were neither for nor against um, expressed concern about the cost of compliance um, and that being passed along to rate payers and the fact that this may only benefit one, one subset of rate payers. Um, 
concerns about the cost of changing the bank credit handling. There'll be fewer expirations, um, which may have an impact on um, the credit bank for AMP clients. Concerns about the interaction of this bill with um, assistance programs like HEAP and LIAP. Um, and then the administrative challenges um, were brought up uh, regarding sinking the billing cycles. Um, at the public hearing, there was a request for information. Representative Foster requested information regarding the anticipated cost for IECG members if the bill were enacted, specifically for one cent kilowatt hours. Um, and then there were some specific suggestions from the testimony. Um, so regarding customer data, if we're doing this for, if we're putting it in statute for one type of customer, it should be done for all. Um, and the committee may wish to carve, explicitly carve out information sharing with the OPA and PUC. Um, there were requests to define or clarify um, billing assistance program, access credits to the customer's billing account, um, special billing arrangements and quote unquote useful information. Um, there were some comments on the role of the PUC and the GEO in this uh, process. Um, net energy billing issues may be best handled through a directive to the DG stakeholder group or possibly for the PUC to examine in conjunction with existing NEB requirements. Um, and then there was a suggestion to authorize the PUC to make changes to the uh, net energy billing regulatory scheme in conformity with their purposes. Um, and some language was suggested and we have not received a preliminary fiscal impact statement. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and see if folks have questions. Great, are there questions from the committee for Lindsay? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lindsay, I I was really struck by the part of the bill, which um, section three, um, sub eight, uh, uh, 3209A sub eight reads in the first sentence, net energy billing data is the property of the customer to which it relates. And that really struck me because it, it it occurred to me that that data darn well ought to belong to the customer. And uh, I was surprised to see that it needed to be, you know, someone felt that it needed to be put in law. Um, do, do you know, and we can ask others if, if you don't, um, whether that data currently does belong to the customer? I'm not aware of any existing language that specifically states that. Um, I don't honestly know. Others may have insight on that. Thank you. Any follow-up, Representative Barry? More questions? Uh, I think I'll ask someone from the PUC, but if you want to uh, go ahead with other questions for Lindsay, that's fine. Thank you. Are there other questions from the committee for Lindsay? I don't see any. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Representative Barry has a question for the PUC. So if uh, Mitch Tannenbaum and Deirdre are still there, if you can bring them across, Jason. They should be on their way over now. There you are, Mitch. Uh, so Representative Barry, why don't you go ahead with your question? Thank you. Um, Mr. Tannenbaum, I don't know if you heard uh, the question. Um, Ms. Schneider, uh, also you know, just wondering who does that data currently belong to? Does it not already belong to the customer, legally speaking? Yes, yes, it does. Um, we, we have a rule at the PUC which prohibits utilities from releasing customer specific data, which includes names, addresses, usage, that is always considered confidential unless a customer consents. Um, and, and, you know, we, we do have, uh, you know, forms and things like that for customers to consent in certain circumstances to having the data released, which would occur in, in, this, in this context. Yes, it, it's, it's their data, uh, clearly, but uh, I don't think there's anything in law that says that, but 
basically there's a rule of they can't release any confidential data. Follow-up question, Representative Barry. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I guess the the maybe the nub of this bill then is about sort of who who pays to have that released to the customer, right? I mean, if um, if the customer owns their data but can't access it, it's not very it doesn't it doesn't accomplish much, right? So if if I'm a net energy billing customer for the sake of argument and and I want access to my data, does the commission not require the utility already to release that to me? I guess the question, Mitch, is does yes. this bill accomplish much? Well, the the basic answer is yes. The net billing customers get, you know, when they get their bills, they see how many credits they have and what's allocated to the bill. Um, I think what this bill is more timing of when the information would be provided to project sponsors uh, so they could kind of rearrange the percentage interest that customers have. So for example, if, if you put in a heat pump, then maybe mm -hmm. the sponsor wants to say, hey, may, maybe you want to take a higher percentage or, or it could be the opposite. So I, I think it's a timing thing for, for leases for one project sponsor. And the, the major question that we had at the PUC is how much it would cost the utilities to redo their systems in order to provide this information as the bill would require and whether it, that would be better off, pushed off to the 2.0 discussion. Any further question, Representative Barry? All set, thank you. Any other questions for the PUC from the committee? Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Mr. Tannenbaum. In uh, testimony uh, regarding this bill earlier, uh, the Public Advocates Office testified that they thought the issues raised by 1955 uh, should be addressed by the PUC rather than necessarily a legislation from the legislature. I'm wondering uh, if you, you would agree that the PUC is capable of doing that. And also, is that something that uh, the PUC is looking at when you do your rate uh, structure uh, uh, investigation? Thank you. This would be separate from, from our rate structure, rate design investigations. We could certainly take a look We'll open a case to figure out how how it might work and what cost what what it might cost. So you know, even though the net billing customers wouldn't pay it, the, the costs obviously the costs would flow to all the ratepayers. So we, we could certainly work with the utilities to see what it would take. Um, again, whether it's better to do it in the two point I, I think the important thing is not to mandate anything happening now that would be an expensive upgrade to the systems. And, and Deidre could follow up on this because who knows what's going to come out at 2.0. So if you're going to have to do the systems, redo the systems after 2.0, it might be more economic to do it all at once. Um, but to answer your question, we, we could certainly gather information about what this might cost and provide a report to the committee. Representative Foster, any follow-up? Yes, uh, just briefly, if I may, uh, Mr. Tannenbaum, would, would you also uh, agree that whether it's done through this legislation or the PUC were to do it, that the eventual cost of providing this information would be passed on to ratepayers? Yes, you know, if, if the utilities are directed to uh, take this on and to uh, change their systems to, to be able to automate it, those costs would be recoverable by ratepayers. Any other questions for the PUC? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mitch and Deirdre, if you're here. Um, I'll recognize Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, if it's appropriate to, I would like to make a motion. Go right ahead. I would move this bill ought not to pass. 
Okay, it's been moved, ought not to pass by Senator Vitelli. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Foster. Debate or discussion? Representative Berry. Thank you, I guess a question for the sponsor. Um, you know, obviously Senator Vitelli, you, you know, saw an issue here. Um, I think, you know, there's some good conversation around the bill at the hearing. Um, is this something that we should be asking the PUC to pursue? Is it, should we consider a letter to the PUC? Are you comfortable that they're moving in the right direction in their in their current proceedings? Um, you know, apart from just not passing the bill, is there some action that you would like to suggest? Because I'm personally very open to that. Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Representative Barry. I think some of that was addressed by the PUC when, when Mitch was just here, what they can do and, and where it could move forward, whether the committee wants to send a letter to spur that on is up to the committee. I'm happy. I think we've had a discussion on these issues. The issues are not gonna go away. Um, they'll come back in different forms. Uh, I feel confident um, in the future. Very good. Other debaters discussion, Representative Grahowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And not to get us into another letter of quagmire, but I did notice that there was some suggestions in the testimony that there were certain aspects of this that um, might be well handled by alerting the DG stakeholder group that we have an interest in them considering through their next year of their work. And so I don't think we need to debate that now, but maybe um, at some point when we're done with all of our bills in the next year or two, um, we could get together a meeting about letters we might want to write. <laughs> and this could be something we flag for that time period since I know I have a, a letter that some people were interested in and in signing on to as well. I just an offer that might be a, um, a way to get it to the further to the attention of the people that are already discussing this matter. Other debate or discussion? Seeing none, why don't we have a call of the roll, Jason? Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Um, yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart is not present. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Representative Kessler is not present. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Representative Sachs is not present. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. Is nine uh, yes in favor of the motion with four absent. Okay, nine in favor uh, and four absent. The motion prevails. So we'll go on to the next bill, which I misappropriately announced um, earlier, LD 1634, an act to create the main generation authority. And I'll go to the sponsor, Representative Grohowski, to see if there is any updates on amendments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think there might, well, we can just start the conversation, I guess. There might be a lot of questions and um, not sure if some of the people that we might want to have present are here, but we could do, we could start the conversation before lunch, if that's your pleasure. Um, I don't have language to screen share with you all, which you probably appreciate right now. <laughs> Well, I guess my question is, we tabled it last time because you wanted an opportunity to work out language. And do we have new language to look at? We do not today have new language to look at. It's been incredibly complex to redraft the bill in a way that I think is more palatable to certain members um, from the original uh, structure, which was borrowing from an existing authority that could borrow uh, 
money through revenue bonding. So um, I've certainly been learning a lot about bonding and, and public capital and what efficiency main trust can do and what fame can do and how that intersects with the PUC process. So the short answer to that question is it's incredibly uh, fascinating experience and not one that is ready for public consumption at this time. And Jason, was there a pending motion on this bill? On 1634, I, I'm not sure. I think that predates me. <laughs> okay, I know, <laughs> excuse me. I know we dealt with it earlier in this session. So you don't have a requ uh, record. Lindsay, do you have a record of any motion? I don't I have a record of any motion, but I can go through, if you'd like me to just sort of touch on when you had the public hearing in the various work sessions, I can do that. No, I'm fine. Um, I, my question was, is there a pending motion? Representative Barry, do you know if there's a pending motion? I don't believe there is. Okay. So <clears throat> from my perspective, I mean, if there's no new amendment and no new information, I'm prepared to, to go ahead and vote on this issue. Um, so I'll make a motion ought not to pass. <laughs> Is there a second to that? Seconded by Representative Foster. Okay, now we can have debate or discussion. Representative Barry. Thank you. Um, I was just about to ask uh, before that motion if uh, the sponsor uh, feels that she could have something to us, uh, at least in a in bullet form uh, for later today or sometime this week. Uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of potential with this bill. And I'd, I'd like to make sure that we try to harness that potential if possible. Okay, Representative Barry posed a question to you, Representative Grohowski. Um, yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. I you know, can circulate an outline. I have one going for my own internal purposes that I could just tweak a little bit. Um, could also let you know what it is verbally uh, whenever you'd like. It was not the question you posed earlier to me. Um, Lindsay has been working really quite a bit with me on a lot of these details. Um, it's not to say that that means that we need to respect the effort that has been going into this redraft, but um, it's not that it's not being worked on at all. It's just that it, uh, does take some time to get answers from all the different agencies involved and to express to them what answers we need <laughs> in a helpful way to get the answers we need. Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, you know, we certainly, um, Representative Grahowski, appreciate the, your detailed language um, and you always tend to come to us with very detailed amendments when you do bring them forward. But, um, you know, it is possible for the committee to vote something, you know, based on, um, based on the, the bullets and to bring that back at language review and allow for reconsideration. So I'd, I would just open that up as a, as a possibility. But personally, I'd like to have lunch first. Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a big bill and even having the opportunity to look at bullet points to direct changes, I'm not sure would be satisfying at this time in our session. Uh, I totally respect all the work that has gone into this to date. And I have no doubt that Representative Grahoski will continue to work on this bill and this idea going forward. Uh, I just um, personally am not prepared to dig in enough at this late date in the session to move forward on the concept and the details that this entails. So I'm gonna be voting in support of the motion ought not to pass. Representative Foster. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree with my good friend from Arousic uh, wholeheartedly and could not have said it better. Any other debate or discussion? So where I'm at, I feel very much in, and I wanna channel a little bit of Representative Wadsworth here, who said this bill seems like it's a bill 
one legislator one legislature ahead of time. So um, I don't know if we're going to get anything at this point um, that's going to really uh, make a difference in my mind about what to do about this bill. Representative Cuddy. Yeah, I would, um, I would, I would go the opposite way, but I think this bill is actually um, a legislature or two too late. We're, we're looking at something that can legitimately um, provide lower cost capital for these projects and will have a real effect in lowering the cost of what we are trying to achieve to, um, to rate payers. And uh, I understand that is not a view that is shared by everyone, but I will be voting uh, in opposition to the ought not to pass motion because I think this is an idea, not only whose time has come, but whose time has passed us by and, and we need to do everything we can to ensure that the rate payers are protected. Any other debate or discussion? Is Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, has there been a tabling motion on this bill? Answer is no. Thank you. Um, I move to table. It's been moved to table. Is there a second to the tabling motion? Second. And that was Representative Cuddy, is that right? That is correct. Okay, it's been moved by Representative Barry to table, seconded by Representative Cuddy. Show of hands, all those in favor of tabling, and I'd ask you to keep your hands up. One, two, three, four. All those opposed, hands up. One, two, three, four, five. So it sounds like five to four, the motion to table fails. The pending question before the committee is ought not to pass. Is the committee ready for the question? Okay, seeing no hands, I'll go to Jason to call the roll. Jason. Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart is not present. Representative Barry. No. Representative Barry is a no. Representative Cuddy. No. Representative Cuddy is a no. Representative Grahowski. No. Representative Grahowski is a no. Representative Kessler. Not present. Representative Ziegler. No. Representative Ziegler is a no. Representative Sachs. Representative Sachs is not present. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. Has five in favor of the motion, four opposed, and four absent. Okay. So uh, five voting in favor, uh, four opposed. The motion at this point prevails. We don't know if that's going to be the majority report until we hear from other people who are absent. Um, but I'll ask uh, perhaps Representative Grahowski um, um, if you have an idea of what your side of the report is going to be. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and I can see if it. I don't need to know politics. details at this. I don't need to know details at this time, uh, but it's going to be ought to pass or ought to pass as amended. Ought to pass as amended, and I'll work with Lindsay on the amendment. Okay, great. So that takes care of that bill. Um, and then I know people are begging to go to lunch, but I just want to remind people how much we have to do. Um, and it's only 1217. So um, I'm going to push on to see if we can get our next bill in and then break for lunch after the next bill. So we'll go to LD 697, an act to enhance the energy security of Maine residents. And it's Representative Barry's bill. Lindsay, have we, got an, have we had the, already the analysis of this bill? The committee has not. Okay, if you could share that with us and we'll get started on the bill. Absolutely. Okay, I just sent out the bill analysis and I will share my screen. Okay. So this is LD 697. Um, 
this bill requires uh, the PUC to consider before issuing, issuing an order of authorization uh, in the event of a reorganization, the risk to national security and the potential economic losses in the state associated, actually, excuse me, okay, um, associated with ownership in full or in part of a transmission and distribution utility located in the state by a foreign government, foreign corporation, or a subsidiary of a foreign corporation. Um, the committee had a public hearing and received testimony. Um, the proponents said, um, pointed out that TND utilities, they said they're a natural monopoly, uh, warrants greater scrutiny to protect main utility customers. Um, the sponsor had sent out an amendment, so some of the testimony related directly to the amendment itself. Um, and the proponent said the focus on in the amendment on improving the situation as opposed to keeping the status quo uh, was positive. Um, those who were neither for nor against or opposed um, said this may not be necessary given the current PUC authority um, and pointed out that the bill is broader than just TNT utilities and may make it harder to attract investment. Um, the sponsor had provided an amendment. Um, this went out on March 4th changing the title to an act to reduce risks to Maine's critical infrastructure. Um, and it reframes the PUC's net benefit examination to look at whether a reorganization will result in lower rates, um, greater local control that improves the ability of local management to protect ratepayer interests. Um, and then it looks at whether a reorganization will avoid ownership by a foreign corporation um, in a manner that could pose risks at any time to system reliability, customer privacy, or customer safety in the event of international hostilities, impede in any way the ability of the commission to exercise its powers and duties, or result in net economic losses to the state. Um, so there were some technical notes and comments from the hearing. Um, um, foreign corporation or its subsidiaries may need further specificity. Um, and there was an amendment suggestion contained in the testimony. Um, we also did receive um, a late submission of testimony from CMP um, expressing concern about this violating the Commerce Clause. Um, so that was something that came up. And in the information request from the committee, Representative Grahowski had asked if the Sierra Club of Maine had suggestions uh, for what additional protections could be provided to ensure benefits to Maine ratepayers based on their involvement in the PUC process. And Representative Foster had asked the PUC if the language in the amendment um, relating to foreign ownership raised any issues with respect to discrimination against foreign companies. Um, as of right now, we do not have any fiscal information. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Great, and Lindsay, do we have, did I understand you correctly that we have an amendment from Representative Barry, is that correct? Um, Representative Barry had authorized the release of an amendment on March 4th. I didn't know if there was anything else he wanted to speak to. Okay, I was gonna to go to him next. Have, has the committee seen the amendment? Have you gone over it yet? Or in your analysis, you talked to the amendment, correct? I spoke to the amendment, yes. Okay, great. So I'll go directly to Representative Barry. And I apologize, Lindsay, I was actually feeding the dog while you were speaking, so I, uh, I apologize. Um, Representative Barry, uh, do you want to give us a brief summary of your amendment or any discussion of your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I think the amendment is really what we heard testimony on. So um, I'm pretty comfortable. Um, I just would suggest one minor tweak, which uh, Lindsay, uh, perhaps you could you could describe that it uh, pertain to um, long term net benefits. And you and I had discussed it. I actually meant to send that out sooner, but it's a, it's a very minor thing. Um, you know, really everything that Lindsay just presented was what people had the opportunity to, to comment on at the public hearing. I was very grateful for all of the great uh, feedback and the, um, the, the comments at that hearing. So um, I'm hoping we can move forward with the bill with, with just one minor amendment and Lindsay is pulling that up now. Bear with me one moment. Do you have that to show to us, Lindsay? I do, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hang on. There we go. Let me share my screen. Okay, so this is a follow up amendment um, uh, proposed by Representative Barry. Um, so 
what this would do is just modify the language. So this is looking at um, the commission reorganization analysis um, and the commission, when they are issuing an order, um, they have to include conditions. And it says these conditions must include provisions that ensure the following. So this is all existing law. Scroll down. And so the amendment would include um, to one of the considerations that neither ratepayers nor investors are adversely affected by the reorganization. And if the reorganization would result in the transfer of ownership and control of a public utility or the parent company of a public utility, that the reorganization provides identifiable long-term net benefits to the utilities ratepayers. So that is the only change in the follow-up amendment. And then you can see below, this is the language which was in the sponsor's proposed amendment sent out on March 4th. And that was prior to the um, public hearing. Representative Barry, anything else you wanna fill us in on your amendment? Thank you, no, that's, uh, that's perfect. So um, the, the only change that I would put forward other than what people testified on is the addition of those three words, identifiable long-term. So there is some clarity that in considering a reorganization, the PUC looks to um, longer term commitments, not just kind of a, you know, upfront sweetener, which, you know, I, I, I worry sometimes may happen and that those benefits are in fact identifiable and um, can be articulated by all the stakeholders. So just, just those three words and you know, if there's discomfort around that, if that's going to make a difference for people, I, it's not a big deal to me, but I, it seems to me to, to be a logical, appropriate um, tweaking that would be in keeping with the, the larger bill. And are you ready to make a motion at this point? I am. Why don't you go ahead and make your motion? Can I move the bill out, out to pass as amended? And as that. you describe your amendment? That's right. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Seconded by Representative Ziegler. Okay, we'll go into debate or discussion. Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of things. First of all, I won't ask for comment at this time, but in testimony from the PUC and the Public Advocates Office, uh, I believe uh, they, they stated that this bill was not necessary. I believe that with this amended language, they would still have the same opinion. Uh, certainly, if they wanted to speak to that, that would be great, but I don't think it's necessary because I believe that the Public Utilities Commission has the ability to address these concerns when considering uh, this issue. Uh, and I would simply state that uh, although I didn't get an answer to my question about uh, the legality, I will say this. Uh, around 1995, a South African company purchased Scott Paper Company, which all of us understand, I think, was a major employer and landholder in the state of Maine. Uh, I joined uh, their company, SAPI, in 1997. And even at that time, there was still a lot of thought uh, that uh, they were simply here to uh, glean the, uh, what they could out of the company as other U.S. firms had done with other paper mills and uh, landholders uh, in the past. Uh, I can say to this day, as most of you know, they in fact became a, a good steward of those properties, increasing capital investment, I believe every year since the purchase and keeping the company uh, viable for citizens of Maine and their employees. Uh, and I would, uh, look to the PUC to uh, have such a standard for anyone considering a, a foreign entity or a foreign corporation considering taking over one of our uh, utilities to do the same. Uh, and I would suggest that, for instance, if uh, the government of Venezuela came for the proposal, they would treat that much differently than say the government of uh, Canada. So I will oppose the pending motion, thank you. Any other debate or discussion? Representative Barry? Thank you. I just want to say I, I appreciate Representative Foster's um, remarks. And it's certainly not the intent of the bill to um, try to delve into non critical infrastructure or you know, uh, a competitive market arena. This is really about critical infrastructure, which we all depend on. 
and which is increasingly central to our lives and livelihoods. Um, it's quite clear from the record at the PUC that there is no procedure, no standard, uh, no precedent for how they would address it if the government of Venezuela were to purchase a portion of our grid or the government of China or you know, even a hostile nation. There's literally nothing in law, nothing in commission precedent, nothing in uh, rule uh, to establish any um, any sort of guidelines there. And that was what uh, the chair, Chair Bartlett referred to. Um, if you look back at my testimony on the bill that others spoke to as well um, in considering the versant docket. So this is really just to provide that parameter. I fully appreciate that um, the, the PUC, you know, feels that it may not be necessary. Um, you know, I think as a policy as a as a procedural matter it's probably not necessary but as a policy matter it is um and finally uh just with respect to um the commerce clause i, I do disagree with cmp there um we have in statute some reporting requirements already in section 3140 around foreign utilities um you know i think the puc would have flagged it if there were a constitutional concern so i'll leave it there thank you <laughs> Any other debate or discussion? Is the committee ready for the question? The, the pending motion is ought to pass as amended, uh, made by uh, Representative Barry, seconded by Representative Ziegler. Um, the clerk will call the roll. Senator Lawrence. No. Senator Lawrence is a no. Senator Vitelli. Senator Vitelli is not present. Senator Stewart. Senator Stewart is not present. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Not present. Representative Ziegler. Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs. Present. Representative Wadsworth? No. Representative Wadsworth is a no. Representative Grignon? Representative Grignon is not present. Representative Foster? No. Representative Foster is a no. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. It is five in favor of the motion, three opposed, and five absent. I've been favor three opposed. And I think Senator Vitelli, is Senator Vitelli still on? I don't think she's on, um, on right now. So it's five to three now. Um, and so um, my uh, minority report will be ought not to pass. Is that yours too, Representative Foster and Representative Wadsworth? That's a yes, Representative Foster. Okay, if you could just say it so people listening audio. Yes, that would be mine as well. Yes. And Representative Wadsworth, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we'll see which comes out as the majority and the minority. We'll have to see how the rest of the people vote um, on this. Um, so that brings us to the end of our bills. And so those of you who are very hungry, um, I'm going to suggest maybe we spare you. Uh, before we start going into uh, committee discussion of budget letter and GEA, and we come back at 1.30 and begin doing those. Is everybody comfortable with that? Anybody have an objection? Show your hand. Okay, so if you could stop your video and mute yourself, and we'll be back at 1.30.
Okay, welcome back to the Joint Standing Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Technology. I'll be your host for the next hour's cruise. And at some point we'll need a Senator for a vote. But since we're continuing the meeting, oh, thank you very much, Senator Stewart. Excellent. <laughs> um, I think a quorum is not absolutely critical at this time. What we have in front of us is a review of the uh, AFA special appropriations table items. And Lindsay has sent out a list to the committee of those, we could review them together. Uh, we also want to complete our letter for GEA review, which is a little less pressing, but be nice to check that box as well. And finally, any remaining work sessions for the afternoon. So Lindsay, could you um, take us through the chart? And I just wanna say thank you so much to you and the other staff for putting this together. Um, it's something that you would have traditionally done a little bit later in the session, but you took it on to um, do it for us sooner so we could weigh in in a more timely fashion. I, for one, greatly appreciate that and um, look forward to your sharing it. Are you able to put it on the shared screen for us? I am. Um, okay. I will warn you, I, I apologize in my email, I apologize now that the font in some spots is a little tiny, so I will do my best. Um, and huge thanks to uh, one of our researchers who did the majority of the work on this and she did a great job. So bear with me Indeed. one moment. Okay. You might need to zoom in. <laughs> yeah, let's see. We can just get that smaller. Okay. Um, does this let me zoom? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so how would you like to go through these? I can walk through the LD number and the title uh, or what would be best? So um, I, I wanna see if the committee has any objection to this, but my recommendation would be that we not bother spending time on you know a bill like the first one that's uh, unanimous ought not to pass. I think that's certainly not uh, worth our time, but um, Unanimous reports, and then perhaps if the committee is interested, we could you know we could look at um, bills that were almost unanimous, like that eleven to one that I see. You know, if if um, if folks want to take a look at those, but my sense is that we, you know, I, I I personally would prefer that we try to be together and give the appropriations committee um, guidance that is helpful. I don't think it's helpful if we're all over the place. So, and I'll look to Representative Wadsworth to agree or disagree with that, but I think generally if we're together, it's it's more useful to, to appropriations. Um, and maybe with that in mind, not seeing any objections, Lindsay, you could just focus us in on those unanimous reports to start. Okay, well, why don't, would it be possible because it's hard to scroll, would you mind if we just yeah. went one by okay. one? Yep, yeah. okay, that sounds um, great. So LD-856, um, and I apologize, I'm not familiar with all of these bills. An act right. to balance renewable energy development with natural and working lands conservation. Um, this was a Representative Barry bill, committee voted, um, 11 ought to pass as amended, one ought not to pass. Um, as of when this chart was put together, um, the fiscal impact was not determined as of yet, but the bill itself listed a general um, a appropriation of $250,000 for the GEO um, in connection with the work they would be doing um, for this bill. Um, so I, the text was not available because it was just in PDF, um, but essentially, and Representative Barry, I'm sure can speak to this also, but the GEO was charged with creating and maintaining a publicly accessible database of energy project, projects that may be used to identify land use or other energy trends and a pilot program to study feasibility of dual use projects. That would be the GEO in collaboration with Department of Agriculture, um, PUC and others. Um, it also directs the DG stakeholder group to convene citing work sessions. Um, so the full text is available in the link um, 
So I guess I will stop there. Great. Is that sufficient for everybody or does anyone need more information? Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to be clear on what you're hoping we're going to do with that information and then I'll have a better sense of if I have enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would suggest that we just go through these quickly, uh, remind ourselves what they are with Lindsay's help. And then um, if there is an appetite for um, only looking at unanimous reports, we could do that. If people want to recommend, you know, um, dive a little deeper, we could do that as well. I think personally, what might be easiest is that we um, focus on the unanimous reports. Any disagreement? Um, and I, I would just also remind everyone that what we're really doing is giving ourselves uh, kind of a leg up in the um, in, in in the process of of um, our priorities going before AFA. Um, typically, the, this conversation would wait until the very very end, and that is often too late. Um, you know, it, it, a, a lot of decisions have already been made. So as we discussed with Representative Wadsworth, um, we have an opportunity here to, um, to look at this, but we can we will have a chance to circle back um, when it comes time for our, um, expressing our preferences on the table. And that might be um, an opportunity to look again at some bills that we don't decide to recommend today. So I'll probably, um, be interested in a motion to just recommend support of the unanimous items, unless people want to go a little bit beyond that. Representative Grahowski, does that answer your question? Uh, I, I think so. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, and, you know, obviously I'm, we'll, we'll open this up to a broader discussion in a moment, but maybe um, we could just, let Lindsay go through each one and remind ourselves what's here in front of um, the committee and in front of the appropriations committee uh, now or soon. Um, so with that, 1429, Lindsay. Okay, LD 1429, an act to achieve carbon neutrality in Maine by the year 2045. Mm -hmm. This was an ENR bill um, from Michelle Dunphy. Um, and let's see. Uh, so fiscal impact, the bill adds to existing greenhouse gas emission goals uh, to also require that beginning January 1st, 2045, uh, net annual greenhouse gas emissions in the state may not exceed zero metric tons. While this new goal does not require additional funding at this time, future legislation taking specific actions to meet the this and other goals may require additional funding. Provision um, applicable to sort of the committee's work is in... Um, Title 38, and the text is available there. Great. Any questions there? Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay. Yeah. All right. LD2, uh, 245, an act regarding rural water districts. Uh, this was an EUT bill, um, and the bill includes a one time transfer from the unappropriated surplus of the general fund to uh, DHHS of $200,000 uh, in fiscal 2021-2022 to the Small Consumer-Owned Water Utility Infrastructure Fund established in Maine Revised Statutes section on or before November 15th, 2021. It also includes a matching allocation to allow the expenditure of the transferred money. Uh, any additional costs to the PUC to implement provisions of the bill are expected to be minor and can be absorbed within the existing budgeted resources. So, I'm great. Any questions for Lindsay there? Discussion. Okay, let's go on to the next. Okay. Just make sure this is 245. All right, 551 an act to accelerate weatherization efforts in the state. This was an EUT bill. Uh, this bill includes a one-time general fund appropriation of $25 million in fiscal year 2021 to 2022 
to the Heating Fuels Efficiency and Weatherization Fund within the Efficiency Main Trust to support weatherization of homes and businesses, additional costs to EMT as a result of changes to the definition of low income and weatherization goals are anticipated to be minor and can be absorbed within existing budgeted resources. Okay, so any questions? All right, let's keep going. Okay. There we go. 1554, an act to provide climate change transition assistance for Maine's energy intensive businesses, another EUT bill. Um, this bill directs Efficiency Maine Trust to establish an industrial climate transition initiative to develop and support climate change mitigation strategies designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at industrial facilities in the state. The bill includes a general fund appropriation of $6 million in fiscal year 2021-2022 to the Efficiency Maine Trust to be deposited in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Trust Fund within the EMT to fund the establishment activities of the Industrial Climate Transition Initiative. Uh, let's see. Okay, any clarifications on that one? Seeing none, let's keep going. Okay, uh, 1555, an act to fund broadband internet infrastructure for marginalized groups in the state, another EUT bill. This bill includes a one-time general fund appropriation of 15 million to the Office of Broadband Development within DECD for the provision of broadband internet infrastructure to benefit marginalized groups. Great, any discussion, Clar clarification, clarifications rather? All right, and we'll okay. keep going. Ah, 1581, an act to require telecommunications companies to divulge information to law enforcement when necessary to respond to a 911 call or locate a person in danger. Um, this was, okay, looks like this majority ought not to pass. Um, oh, and no fiscal impact. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's there. Yeah, okay, we'll it's skip over one. that one. But, yep. and, all right, LD80, an act to provide critical communications for family farms, businesses, and residences by strategic public investment in high-speed internet and broadband infrastructure. Um, this bill requires that 33% of sales and use tax revenue collected by the state tax assessor uh, from marketplace facilitators with respect to marketplace facilitated sales after required transfers to other funds be transferred to the Connect Main Authority to further deployment of high-speed internet and broadband infrastructure to unserved and underserved areas of the state. Um, this was, okay, uh, 10 ought not to pass and three ought to pass as amended fiscal impact not yet determined, and then this is the relevant provision. This list includes, um, you know, bills that would touch on EUT areas, so it's not just those with a fiscal impact. Um, so. Great, any clarifications there? And what do we have, one more? Yep, hang on. One more. That was a little jumpy. Okay, LD506, an act to reduce the tax burden on low income electricity customers. Uh, this bill provides a sales tax exemption for residential electricity consumed by eligible customers and would result in a reduction of general fund revenue of $68,400 in fiscal year 2021-2022 and $137,750 in fiscal year 22 to 23. It would also result in a reduction in local government fund revenue of $3,600 in fiscal year 2021 to 2022 and 7,250 in fiscal year 2022 to 2023. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lindsay, again, for, for putting all of this together. And you know, my sense from having talked to individual members of the committee is that there's not an appetite to go too far on this, but um, perhaps a willingness to, at the very least, recommend that Unit, those unanimous items be funded. I think there were only a couple. Um, there have there has been some interest expressed to me on the part of the PUC and the public advocate on speaking to um, those two unanimous bills. And you know, I guess I would just ask if if um, other bills are of importance to members and people want to include them. Um, 
So I'll be looking for a motion soon uh, to, to, uh, to include in our recommendation to AFA um, a particular bill. I think we can vote on those um, individually. If there's no motion to include one, then we can um, just assume that that's not um, of burning importance to, to the committee at this time. Um, but I would like to make sure that the public advocate and the uh, UC have a chance to just uh, mark their particular strong priorities at this time. So at first, let me just ask if the committee has any questions or discussion. All right, um, let me bring in Mr. Harwood first and um, Jason, if you could bring him over, that would be great. I believe this is with respect to uh, LD506. And Mr. Harwood, welcome. And am I, am I correct? Is that, I, I don't actually recall for sure the LD, but there was one in particular on this list that I think was of particular importance to your office. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you, Chair Barry. Um, we are strongly in support of LD 506 and have indicated to the Appropriations Committee and the Governor's Office our strong support for that. I think at this time, with the high energy costs and the high standard offer rates that <laughs> folks are struggling with, the idea of putting a sales tax on electricity sales to low income. Uh, Mainers is just not good public policy. It seems unfair and punitive. Um, electricity is a necessity, and uh, the idea of putting a sales tax on top of it seems, uh, as I say, unfair. It's a modest fiscal note uh, of about $140,000 a year, and we think that would be a prudent uh, investment by the state to help these uh, low-income households get through this process and frankly, uh, get through future uh, years where uh, costs are a struggle for them. So we are strongly supporting and urging the legislature to pass and enact LD 506 to relieve low-income electricity consumers from paying a sales tax. Thank you, Mr. Harwood. Uh, Senator Vitelli. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Harwood, for being here. Uh, I would certainly agree with what you just stated. Uh, just a quick question. I was just looking at the bill, and the amendment makes has an effective date of January 1st, 2022. So I guess the question would be, if this goes forward, is this going to be retroactive to January of this year? How, how are you going to accommodate that? Yeah, that that's, a, that's an important detail it needs to. This, this bill was unanimously bipartisan reported out of taxation last year and uh, went to the appropriations table and is still there. So everything is sort of a year late. And I think that it would be uh, a welcome, a friendly amendment to uh, push that date out a year in the, in the bill. Um, I know Senator Breen is looking at it and as, as others and, I'm, uh, and I take it, Senator, that's a good suggestion. That's a great point. Can I ever tell you anything else? Nope, that was it, so thank you. And for new members, that is something they can do in appropriations. They have that magic um, to adjust the language and it's a really good flag uh, for them. Uh, you know, I, I do wanna um, be clear, this is a bill from another committee and um, we don't necessarily have to weigh in, but if we feel that it's useful um, to add our voice of support, um, then I think you know that it, it, this is certainly a good time to do it because now is when the big money decisions are being made. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Harwood or discussion? Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just didn't realize that we were taxing electricity for residential repairs and I don't see it on my bill. So where is it hidden? Yeah. Thank you, Representative Grahowski. I probably should have been a little clearer. The first 750 kilowatt hours are tax-free. The tax only kicks in above that. So uh, it's for above average users of uh, electricity.
but as we know, there are many low income people who really have little choice to uh, use supplemental electricity to get through the winter. I mean, the idea of a low income family turning on the oven and opening the oven door just to keep the kitchen warm enough to live in it is a terrible plight, but it only gets worse when the C CMP or Versant bill comes and the state of Maine has tacked on a sales tax. Other discussion on this one? Great, um, thank you very much, Mr. Harwood. So thank you. at this time, um, just in the interest of doing things kind of one at a time, um, I just wanna see if there's any motion on the part of anyone on the committee to include this as a recommendation in our uh, letter to appropriations. So moved. And, all right, the move by Senator Vitelli is our second. All right, seconded by Representative Ziegler. Any discussion? All right. So we'll go to a vote, uh, uh, Representative Krahowski, discussion first. Um, I just wanna say that I, I think this seems like a common sense thing to do right now, but I do feel like kind of weird <laughs> weighing in on a bill that I didn't hear. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. simple enough that I understand it, but I don't, I'm just like a little bit concerned about the precedent of that for this committee. Like, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to weigh in on things that we've heard and worked on, but. Again, like I'm, I'm okay with doing it in this case because it seems like pretty much a, a straight bill that obviously another committee understood and weighed in on, but just wanted to flag that I, I don't know if this is like a real, something I'm gonna be comfortable with across multiple bills and other committees. Thank you, Representative Grahowski. Um, I, I would concur with that. Rep, uh, Senator Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what, the process is going to be after we vote. Are we effectively voting to like send a letter to AFA outlining what bills we generally support? Um, I think my question is sort of along the same lines as Representative Grahowski's mm -hmm. um, without, and, and, and are we going to take it <clears throat> like, are we doing votes on, the whole letter or are we doing individual votes on individual bills to include in a letter? Um, can you outline what you're thinking a little bit uh, in that regard, please? Yes, excellent question. So uh, right now the committee has a letter on the supplemental budget as proposed by the chief executive and as we've heard it. So we have voted on our recommendations and they were, I think a number of them were divided, but we did make um, uh, put, you know, recommendations often split uh, on the supplemental budget that was put forward before us. Uh, because the budget is where most of the money, um, you know, it, and, and most of the, the big money decisions are made, we are uh, able to look at, at other bills right now and add any recommendations we may have to our to the, that same letter to appropriations and allow them to consider the possibility of including some of these items in the budget rather than waiting and trying to fund them off the table. And I think, uh, Senator Stewart, you've been around long enough to know that the table is um, a pretty tough place for a bill to end up. So this really is an opportunity for us with our, our letter on the supplemental to also flag a few bills that we think are worth considering sooner. Um, and by tucking, by killing the bill, tucking it into the budget, um, you know, we can make that policy happen. I don't, think this committee, you know, again, based on my conversations, has the appetite to go much beyond the unanimous bills, maybe, you know, some of the 11 ones. Um, but uh, we're pretty fortunate that we don't have a ton of bills. You know, if was, this was the HHS committee, I might not even bother with this conversation <laughs> because it would be a really long one. 
but uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to have just a few. And I think this, you know, it's, this is a, a bit of a, of a pilot project. I think we want to see if it's, you know, it's helpful. Um, but uh, the, the idea is to get, give some additional guidance uh, to the appropriations committee. And our, our former appropriations member, Representative Wadsworth, who's um, uh, may or may not be here, um, had also indicated that, you know, it's helpful to have that guidance sooner rather than later as an appropriations member. Does that make, does that answer the question? So just, and I think the idea is to take some, some uh, straw votes right now on items that the committee wants to, to bring up and uh, anything that doesn't get brought up, I think, is not going in our recommendations. Um, anything that does go into our recommendations can reflect, you know, a vote of, uh, you know, eight to four or, you know, it can be split. It can be nuanced. But I think uh, ideally we have certain things that the committee agrees on. And, and that's the best guidance we can possibly give to appropriations. You know, something like this bill, if we like it. Um, and appropriations, here's that, that could be helpful to them. Any discussion of this particular um, I, uh, bill? It's a public advocate uh, agency bill and Mr. Harwood has spoken to it. Uh, it is a unanimous report with a fiscal note of, I believe it was 140,000. Okay. Why don't we uh, go ahead to uh, a show of hands. If there's not unanimity, then we may need to call the roll, but I just wanna see if we can be efficient and do this with a show of hands. Um, so could all those in favor of, in, of including this in our recommendations, uh, please raise their hand. Okay, that was easy. It's unanimous. Representative Wadsworth is not with us, but he and others can um, register their preferences later. Um, Lindsay, do you need to call the roll um, for that purpose? Um, I don't think so. I don't know if we, this I, I believe would be more of a procedural vote. So I don't know that there's, you know, because this isn't related to a bill, this is just regarding what language might go in a letter. I don't, do you want to try to keep something open or just? I, yeah, I think, it, my, my only hesitation is that if a, if a member of the committee who's not present um, wishes to register their disagreement um, with something that we have done here, I just want to make sure you kind of have, um, have that on record. But why don't you, if, if you could just take note of who's not here and just circle back with them in case they want to register a difference of opinion, that would be helpful. Or we could call the roll if that's easier for you. Actually, that would be fabulous. Yeah, okay. All right, let's do that. So um, it, uh, the, the question is, do we recommend LD506 for funding, um, ideally in the supplemental, but if not off the table uh, to the appropriations committee in our letter regarding the supplemental? And the committee clerk will call the roll. A vote of yes will be a vote to include it in our letter. Senator Lawrence, not present. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart. Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Not present. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Representative Sachs, not present. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. Nine in favor and four absent. Great, thank you. And if uh, the committee, 
it doesn't have any objection. I'll go on next to the other unanimous report that was reflected on Deirdre's sheet. And that was a bill from the Public Utilities Commission, uh, or excuse me, by Senator Guerin, sponsored by Senator Guerin. And the Public Utilities Commission had a particular um, interest in this bill. Jason, could you bring in Deirdre Schneider, please? And Mitch Tannenbaum also. Great. And Deirdre, do you want to speak to this or Mitch or who should go I first? I, could, I can speak to it. Thank you. Okay, great. So LD 245 was a bill this committee heard last session. I think it was a unanimous vote. The piece that we're most concerned about is uh, section two of the bill. And that would allow after uh, investigation by the commission, if they determine uh, trustees of a consumer owned water utility, there's not a sufficient number to constitute a quorum that the commission can appoint a receiver, which would have all the authority and duties of a full board of trustees. Um, this one is really important because I think you've heard a lot in the past couple of years about some uh, ability of these smaller COUs to maintain a quorum of trustees to get the work done. Um, so this, you know, those that can result in the inability to sign documents, pay bills, make payroll, purchase equipment and chemicals required for the operation of the district. So having this provision available um, would allow it, you know, to temporarily allow the, the utility to keep the operations going in a way that's uh, important for the ratepayers of that utility. Um, the reason this is on the appropriations table is because there's a secondary piece to this bill that created a fund for infrastructure improvement grants. Um, and it had a $200,000 going into this fund from, um, I think it was from, hold on one second, I have it right here. It was $200,000 from the um, general fund unappropriated surplus to this consumer owned water utility infrastructure fund, unless it was an equivalent amount of money um, available federally from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. And this whole fund and granting program would be under the DHHS drinking water program. So that $200,000 funding piece is what has stuck this on the table. And we're just concerned about it losing this really important piece about this um, receiver because of that $200,000 funding. Um, I've spoken to Senator Guerin about this too. And I think, you know, I don't want to speak for her, but I do think she also thinks that this receiver piece is important. Um, and we were trying to get at, because there was some talk that this was supposed to be funded, but I haven't seen anything in the supplemental budget to indicate that. I've reached out to the drinking water program, but haven't heard back if they're aware of the funding being available. Um, so, I mean, obviously infrastructure improvements are really important as well. And so, um, but for, for our purposes, we're really focused on section two of the bill and that receiver piece. Thank you, Deirdre. And um, other questions? This was a bill we worked a long time ago, but unanimous report, pretty small fiscal impact. And I'm personally interested in including it in our recommendation to AFA but I want to hear what others have to say. Any discussion, Representative Grahowski? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't know if anyone had information <laughs> from Senator Davis, but it looks like he did file an amendment that nothing's happened with, but it gets rid of that fiscal impact. It's on the website, um, if I'm reading it correct, but it keeps correctly, it keeps that section two so I just wonder if there, somebody's already devised a solution for this problem. Deirdre? It, it wasn't adopted last session. So I think it was offered and I don't know if it ever actually got discussed, but it was never adopted. So what was adopted was the committee amendment and that's why it wound, wound up pending um, enactment and went on the table. Thank you. Rep. Sam Grahowski, does that answer your question? Well, I mean, I saw that, but I didn't know if Senator Davis maybe had a plan because he's on and beyond appropriations. <laughs> uh, sounds like uh, Senator Stewart might have a comment yeah. on this topic as well. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to answer the representative's question, I believe that there was an attempt to uh, basically find a way to remove it from the appropriations table, and that attempt failed in the Senate, which sometimes happens when you've got you know 
bills that are stalled out on the table. We sometimes try to find workarounds, but they typically don't get too far. So <laughs> that's, that's why. That's helpful. So it sounds like it really needs this uh, small amount of funding to, to move forward. Okay, any other discussion or motion on this bill? Move it in, move it out, move it up, move it down. Uh, Senator Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair, I'd move this in. Okay, it's moved in, uh, seconded by Representative Wadsworth. Any discussion? Okay, Jason, could you call the roll? And a vote of yes will be a vote to um, include this in our letter to appropriations. Senator Lawrence is not present. Senator Vitelli? Um, yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Not present. Representative Ziegler? Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs? Not present. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. It's nine in favor and four absent. Great, thank you, Jason. So um, that will be included in our letter and will reflect um, also the preferences of anyone who's absent and registers their preferences with Jason um, within the time allotted. And I believe that is, Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that's, those are the bills that are unanimous that's correct. in their committee votes. Okay. So uh, for me, that was, those were the, the most important. Are there other bills that we've reviewed that, that folks would like to, to consider including in our report back? Okay, seeing none. Lindsay, I think we have a letter. Excellent. Oh. Uh, Representative Wadsworth. And to be clear, they can still fund those off the table even without us. Exactly. Just That's right. That's exactly right. I think what we're doing is signaling um, some particular priorities that we think should be dealt with sooner rather than later, you know, perhaps in the supplemental, if at all possible. And that would, you know, certainly underscore their importance, if, even if they do need to wait until the table. And then other items um, that we haven't talked about, we can go back and rank them um, when it comes time to share our preferences for the table. And there will be a process for that as well. And we're ahead of the game. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, anything else you need on this from us? Okay. So that will bring us to the GEA review. Um, Lindsay, maybe you could just give us a reminder as to that uh, process and where we're at in it. And Representative Grahowski, I'll go to you first. Sorry, um, before we move on, I think I maybe missed when we voted on the other parts of the supplemental budget that were originally in our purview. Is it too late to register our votes for that since this project seems like it's only just concluding? Or can anyone refresh my memory on the process if it's different than for a regular bill? I'll ask Lindsay for help with that. It's different than, than a regular bill. Um, so essentially what we did was we walked through um, each of the elements um, for each of the initiatives to vote on whether um, the committee wanted it included or not. Um, so I can, I can give you an overview um, of where that stood. I don't know if I don't believe usually there's a sort of a later registration process. Again, I believe it's usually just sort of a procedural vote for whoever's there. Um, but I'd be happy to walk through that now. Um, also, once we put all this together in a letter for AFA, I'll you know be providing a copy of that to the committee. So whatever you would prefer. Um, Lindsay, what I would suggest is that you just share your draft letter 
um, as soon as it's ready by email. And then if any member wants to be registered as you know, voting um, differently, um, would you try to incorporate that into the final version of the letter? Is that doable? I believe that's doable. The only thing I'll point out is the deadline for this is the 17th. So if we're keeping open a voting window and I've got to get it there on the 17th, um, I will be including a, if I don't hear from you by X time, it's going to go out. Um, Perfect. Because this seems like it's important to get in on time. Excellent. That's very appropriate. Thank you so much. Okay. So that brings us to the GEA review. Okay, so this is um, coming back to uh, the committee's review of the Public Utilities Commission. Um, they came in and provided a presentation. Um, actually, let me bring up when that was. Um, but I think at this point, you know, the committee basically needs to decide, um, you know, after reviewing the report that they provided in connection with GEA, they came in and gave a presentation. They were also available when um, the committee heard their annual report. Um, with any questions. Um, so the committee has to decide whether, uh, to what extent the agency is operating within its statutory authority, their degree of success in meeting their goals and objectives for their programs, their degree of success in meeting statutory and administrative mandates, and the extent to which the agency has increased or reduced filing and paperwork burdens on the public. Um, and Representative Barry had sent around um, some thoughts that he had on the things that may, you know, the committee can, you know, provide their findings, um, but then also if there are areas that you just would want to, you know, point out to the PUC, um, you're certainly able to do that. Um, and looking at some past examples, I found um, uh, this was from February 2020, the committee reviewed the Office of the Public Advocate, and the letter basically says the committee finds that the Office of the Public Advocate is operating within its statutory authority. So there's not a robust report or anything super fancy, um, but it's up to the committee what you'd like to include. Great. So um, Lindsay's already referenced some recommendations I had um, just to review those um, since they may be lost in your inbox somewhere. Um, if your inbox is anything like mine, uh, my suggestion to the committee was that we find that the Public Utilities Commission is operating within its statutory authority and that we further uh, make three suggestions uh, for ongoing improvement. And the first of those would be to um, attempt to um, make the commission even more open to public process. It does have a, a very robust public process component now, uh, but sometimes the formality I think can be intimidating. And the CMS or case management system uh, for me personally and for others I've spoken with has been somewhat daunting. So um, the first bullet would be to encourage changes to the CMS to um, consider making it easier for the public to locate docket information and to participate in PUC proceedings. The second bullet also relates to public participation. And this is the, really the financial burden um, of taking the time. And in some cases, um, you know, there's a legal expertise that's required to participate because these are quasi-judicial proceedings and lawyers aren't cheap. So, um, to try to at least slightly um, uh, uh, increase the possibility that the average member of the public can participate and take the time to do so, to explore, have the PUC explore intervener compensation in consideration of the burden of participating in proceedings. So we have, you know, Changes to the case management system, um, explore, you know, explore that, explore intervener compensation. And then the third bullet would be to consider additional staffing to fully carry out the complex responsibilities of utility oversight. And I think our utilities are you know, bigger and more complex than ever. Um, we, you know, we see that all the time in our committee's work. And 
you know, one example I think of is that we, we heard the other day from the commission that they have one engineer on the staff um, and they're evaluating some very sophisticated engineering um, decisions by our, our various utilities, whether it's gas or water or electric. So I think considering some additional staffing to really um, you know, assess the planning function, um, the sophisticated nature of grid modernization calls for a whole new level of expertise. Um, and so the third bullet would be to consider additional staffing for that purpose. And that's um, what I wanted to put forward as a, as a possible um, kind of a, uh, encouragement to the PUC. Uh, as part of our letter, this is our opportunity to review their work. And again, I would, uh, the, the main finding is that they are in fact, yes, operating within their statutory authority. So these would just be kind of a gentle, you know, um, suggestion for, for ongoing improvement that we would include. And I'm interested in opening up for discussion now and see what people think. If you have ideas about things you'd like to include in our letter, and then we can hopefully a rabbit consensus and if necessary, take a vote. Are there other, well, either discussion of what I just put forward or um, other ideas? Representative Grahowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the overall analysis that they are performing within their authority is accurate and um, I personally don't see a reason not to suggest some possible areas of improvement. It's certainly not binding in any way. Um, maybe even just talking about it is effective, but uh, I do want to especially underscore your first one about the case management system. Uh, I think the website rebuild has been really helpful and it's like a little more intuitive than what we had before, but unless there was an update, I haven't been in the CMS in a little bit, but um, for those of you who might not play around in there often, it's like really unusual <laughs> for website design, like boxes popping up and I can't look at files without downloading it to my computer. And then my, I'm like, why is my hard drive full? And it's because there's a bazillion things I downloaded from the PUC over and over and over again, because they are not named in any kind of fashion that anyone could ever understand. So um, long story short, I do think that that's a great recognition. This might be something the PUC is already thinking about, um, but I would be happy to underscore that I think that would, a more intuitive system would help the public uh, participate and understand what's going on. At least if they could look at the documents in a web browser, that would be a, a big first step, I think. Thank you. Other discussion? And that was in keeping with the, the fourth bullet that we're supposed to evaluate. Um, filing requirements, paper, paperwork duplication, um, you know, that's sort of a elimination of red tape is how I read that um, category of the GEA process. And um, I think that anytime we can increase public accessibility, we're effectively doing that. I'll go to Representative Cuddy next. I just want to say that I, I agreed with your um, concept around suggesting some help for the uh, interveners that it, as a process, it's complicated. And uh, I also wanted to say that regarding Representative Grahowski's point about the difficulty of finding things, I had a, a constituent recently ask me about a particular docket and I tried to find information on the docket and it was not um, what I would call easy. And uh, luckily Ms. Schneider is really good at her job. And so I was able to ask her directly to <laughs> help me out and do it for me, but it would be nice if it were a, a simple matter to, to find it. Great, other discussion? So I suppose that we could, um, you, uh, Lindsay, you probably need a vote from us. So perhaps we should have a motion and a second and a vote. Lindsay, would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. If there's no other discussion, maybe we could move to a motion. Representative Grahowski. Um, I move that we find the PUC, uh, I guess, functioning within its authority and would like to include in our letter saying such 
the three suggestions that Representative Barry put forward for um, consideration by the PUC. Uh, is there a second? Seconded by Representative Cuddy. Any discussion? Representative Foster. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering, uh, I know in the past we've submitted letters, uh, at least uh, in the 129th, we had an opportunity to review them before we actually agreed to having our signature on them. Is that still the case? Uh, see something in writing? Um, Lindsay. Um, the, the letter is due today, um, but I can certainly, um, I don't know if a day or two is going to make that big a difference. So if, you know, once the committee decides where you want to go, I can put something together and um, send it out. Representative Foster, it would be helpful if I um, repeat that or if, if Lindsay emails it out um, and we could come back to this. If she has jotted down your uh, points and could email that, that would be uh, beneficial, I think. Okay. Do that right now. Great. Representative Grahowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add that if we're late on this deadline, I don't know what the punishment of that is. I don't know that they're going to lock up the EUT because we'd never finish our <laughs> meeting work. That is correct. There is no late penalty for this one. I just sent out the email to the committee, so it should be in your inbox. Oh, great. Thank you. We'll just give it a moment. Yeah, and the GA review is uh, fortunately not something that will be reported to the full legislature. There's no um, additional vote that's needed. This is a letter to the um, Committee on Government Oversight. No, excuse me. Nope, um, that's the clause eyes. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. This is a letter to, Lindsay, full, remind me. Full legislature. The full legislature, that's right. But then there's no vote on it. It's a communication, correct? I believe that's correct. Thank you. Learn something new every day. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Just to clarify, this is uh, non-binding. It's just a suggestion from the committee on some things that they need to look at going forward, correct? Or we would suggest they look at. That is correct. And I want to just convey um, some information I've received from the Public Utilities Commission. Um, first of all, I was mistaken. I, I could have sworn I had heard one engineer. It turns out they do actually have five. So that may not be the greatest need, although um, I, I do firmly believe that the team with the most engineers wins and having engineers is a good thing. Um, the other uh, item that I just wanted to flag that I also heard about from the PUC is that there is also a bill um, that deals with intervener funding before the uh, ENR committee. And the PUC, in fact, had suggested that this issue of intervener funding be looked at. So they are already interested and are working on this. So we'd essentially be encouraging them to go down a road they're already going down, which probably can't hurt. Um, and uh, 
you know, maybe the tone could be, could reflect that, Lindsay. It could just be a, you know, we appreciate this and encourage that, um, that direction. So any other discussion, Representative Foster, you all set? I believe so. Okay. So I think we have a motion and a second and we can go to a vote and I'll ask Jason to call the roll. Senator Lawrence is not present. Senator Vitelli? Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart? Yes. Senator Stewart is a yes. Representative Barry? Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy? Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Grahowski? Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler? Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler? Not present. Representative Sachs is not present. Representative Wadsworth? Yes. Representative Wadsworth is a yes. Representative Grignon? Not present. Representative Foster? Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo? Yes. Representative Carlo is a yes. Is nine in favor and four not present or absent. Great. And Lindsay, I think there was one bill that was tabled until later today. And is that it for our list? Um, well, one thing I just want to confirm. So on the GEA follow-up, um, I'll get to drafting on that. Did the committee want to see that letter before it goes out? I personally don't need it, but are there any who would like it? Oh, looks like we don't. All right. Thank you. Um, so the only LD170 was on the, oh, excuse me. I, that was my mistake. I thought it was, but it is not. Um, so I think the, we had two bills tabled this morning. Yes. We did, and we could go back to work those if we would like to do so. Um, I think one of them pertained to the solar language that the governor's energy office had worked on. And um, in the interest of making sure there's a public hearing, um, I did include that language in a concept draft bill um, for tomorrow. So the language Lindsay has sent it out to interested parties and of course to members of the committee that's in your inbox and it's LD 1026. So we will be able to have a hearing on that language tomorrow. Um, that's the good news. Um, and I think it, you know, it, it does raise the question of how, you know, how we want to proceed uh, with Senator Stewart's bill and, you know, whether that's a, a bill that we could possibly go ahead and vote on or if people feel like we need to keep that one around as well. Representative Grahowski. Uh, I had my hand sending back on 170, but we'll come back to that. You're going to go back to 170? Well, okay. Well, we have, so we have two bills. We're not in work session on either one. If there's an interest in going into work session on any bill at this time, um, but I think in particular those, um, I would be happy to entertain the motion. I'm interested in moving us forward to the extent possible. So Representative Grahowski, did you want to um, make a motion on, on LD-170 to go into work session? Um, I, I, I'm willing to do that. I am happy though, also for Senator Stewart to talk about the bills we were just talking about, if that makes more sense, and then I can make my motion. That sounds fine. All right. Senator Stewart. Thanks. Uh, so the short answer, I guess, if the question is, uh, do we want to go into work session now, uh, or wait until there's a hearing tomorrow? Um, I don't think that makes a heck of a lot of sense to take it up today until we've gotten feedback on it. So um, 
I'm fine with just not going into work session on it and we'll work it tomorrow. Um, instead, I think that was Mark's um, sort of desire before he left today as well. Any other discussion on that item? Uh, Representative Cuddy? I, I may have missed this, but do we have the language for for um, the bill for 643? Uh, Is it 643 or 634 or um, Senator Stewart? I've, I've forgotten, I apologize. It's, there's it's, a six and a three in it, but that's all I'm sure about. It's, it's 634 okay. uh, and uh, if, uh, Clearly, Lindsay has the language already if you've asked her to put it into a concept draft in a different bill. So, um, Lindsay, if you want to go ahead um, and share that with the committee, I, I have no problem sharing it today um, in, in the interest of making folks aware of what it is and then have time to reflect on it and deal with it tomorrow. So, I, I guess the question I would have is, Lindsay, if you want to share language on LD 634. We could do that. Um, I also, at some point, I would, I'd like to talk about what the process would be for um, for public hearing on that bill. Um, did do you have Do you have the language uh, the sponsor is referring to? Yes, I have the the email that came in from the governor's energy office, and then that language was incorporated into your concept draft, mm -hmm. which has now so that's been published that is what will be the subject of the public hearing tomorrow great um, thank you so i can i can bring up that language right now for the committee well before you do bring it up maybe we should have a motion to go into work session um if we are going over the specific language and that way we're you know we're actually clear on what we're talking about representative cuddy You're muted. There we go. I apologize. My hand was still up from earlier. Got it. Senator Stewart. Yeah. I, again, when I say share the language, we can email it, uh, and let folks digest it and then, you know, pick it up tomorrow. I don't, again, I don't think going into a work session right now makes sense. And then I mean, what's, what's, we're, we're literally just wasting time at this point. So I think we just move on. And if you want to have a public hearing on this, we can do that tomorrow and then vote on it tomorrow. Um, but I think at this point, I, I don't understand what we're shooting for now. Uh, thank you. Representative Grahowski. Um, I might've missed it, but what is the LD number of the concept draft that this language is going into? That is LD 1026 and okay. Lindsay, has emailed it out. So there is an advertised public hearing, stakeholders will be able to weigh in. Um, there are a couple different parts to that bill, but I think we'll be, at least we'll be able to hear from all comers on the proposal. And that's the primary objective from my standpoint, just in, in terms of public process. Representative Grahowski. Um, great. I'm happy to wait and look at that on my own time. And then I would move that we go into work session on LD 170. All right. It's been moved to go into work session on LD 170. Is our second? Seconded by Representative Cuddy. And where are we on that bill, Representative Krahowski? I believe that's your bill. <laughs> I did it to myself. <laughs> um, yes, it is my bill. Thank you. Um, I sent out a amendment that was pretty much the same as what we had looked at together via the screen share. And I'm sorry, I didn't get it out till last night, um, but did try to incorporate a little bit of feedback that I had received. So and I do have one more piece of feedback I wanna include in there. Um, so maybe Lindsay, if you have that, you just look at it again really quick and just get people's sense um, of, of where you want to go and if you feel like you mostly have a decision <clears throat> on that. Um, so this is basically the whole bill we're looking at. There aren't any other sections that are um, hiding in the original draft, just so you know, for reference. 
Uh, again, the non-essential transmission line, same definition as we looked at last week, not constructed primarily to provide reliability in the state or meet renewable energy goals, not constructed to provide electricity to retail customers within the state. So it's the so-called merchant for profit transmission lines we're talking about here. Um, this part, the next part here, basically, um, again, same as what we talked about, what I shared last week, the CPCN for these sort of projects can only be granted by the Public Utilities Commission if a certain number of um, you know, good faith attempts have been made to enter into negotiations with the OPA um, to determine any possible benefits or protections for ratepayers. Uh, if the developer has made reasonable attempts to engage with the impacted communities um, through public meetings and through their municipal officers, that's, that's the same. I don't think I made any changes there. Um, that they've checked around to see if there's any local entity that's interested in financing this at a lower cost um, and you know to get more economic benefits for the state. And on the flip side, the OPA, we're asking them to you know, solicit some public comment to take into the negotiations with them, what the public feels, um, seek to negotiate benefits um, as described in you know, in A1 above, here we added the frontline communities and a definition of that um, per some feedback I received from the public advocate. So that was, that's a new piece since the last time. And um, this part was the same that we were seeking that the line should meet, you know, at least the minimum standards, of course, for the uh, for the environment, through the DEP permitting process, but if there are better standards, better productions, like we saw with the NACEC line, there were additional um, things that they agreed to, uh, including, I think, um, not spraying herbicides for one, was one that they, they opted uh, to provide in their agreement. So, and then um, I think Lindsay had a change to the impacted communities definition. It, I was originally looking at it as impacted municipalities, but that was um, sort of focused on organized territories. So this definition has been broadened to include the unorganized or deorganized territories. And similarly, the officers of those would be the county commissioners in the case that they're unorganized or deorganized. So the only real new piece in here, I think, was communities instead of municipalities um, and the frontline communities definition. And this definition, I think, uh, is in alignment with the work that the executive branch has done uh, based on a bill that this committee worked on. It was Representative Dara's bill um, to try to better define these, these concepts um, or these sort of communities that have experienced a greater impact of climate change compared to other communities. And I think that's it here. And then this section, there's the section again that came from Representative Grignon's bill about uh, eminent domain and needing uh, municipal officer approval in addition to the PUC. And what was suggested to me today that I wanted to bring in front of this committee because this was a bill, this was language from a bill that did pass the House and the Senate a couple of years ago. Uh, an idea that was brought to me was to say that instead of that decision being placed on those municipal officers, instead make sure that the Public Utilities Commission has communicated with the municipal officers um, around what their interests are and experience would be uh, for the people that they represent before the Public Utilities Commission makes their decision about whether that uh, taking would be approved or disapproved. Um, and I thought that made sense, um, but I'd be curious if others are interested in that change from a bill that some of us have debated before, although recognize it predates this particular committee configuration, so we could decide we want to do something totally differently, but pretty much it's exact. It's almost exactly what we looked at together last week, just written down in a better format than how I had it before. I think I'm happy to take any questions, get your feedback. I hope we can consider uh, voting on this today and, and recognize that if anyone sees, you know, stews over the final language later and decides they don't like where they ended up, I'm always happy to support a reconsideration personally. Great. 
Are there questions for Representative Grahowski about her adjustments to the bill? I guess I have one, Representative Grahowski. So the, the definition of frontline communities, was that from the, um, the, the discussions in ENR pursuant to LD 1682? Is that what I heard you say? Um, I do think so. I think Lindsay will be able to help answer that question because that's sort of the uh, rabbit hole I <laughs> sent her down and she came out with an answer that I liked. So um, I, I think that that's correct, but she could probably double check that. I actually don't recall where I got that definition. So let me just do a little digging and figure that out. Well, it, you know, it's probably not super important. It just, I, I, I think consistency is helpful. I was just, you know, wanted to check that there was definitional consistency. That's all. But probably something we can adjust in language review if we need to. Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll ask the sponsor this first. Uh, uh, Representative Grahowski has, has the PUC or, or the public advocate, uh, but most especially the PUC had a chance to look at this language. Um, thank you, Representative Foster, for the question. Um, yes, although, well, I did send this latest draft to them as well um, last night, but I did speak with them a couple of times last week on the particulars um, of this bill. So I think they, whether or not they'd be happy to come over and answer any questions you have or whether or not they, they will, I think, I think that they will. And I, I think they understand the bill and are able to, um, to work within its structure, but feel free to ask them that as well. Representative Foster. Yes, I certainly will. Uh, so a little more than a year ago, their testimony, neither for nor against indicated that they, uh, they did have some concerns about the bill at that time. And I would have, would like the opportunity for them to, to uh, address those concerns at least, or any others they may have at this time with this new language. Thank you. Let's do that. Would you like to bring in um, the GEO or, I'm sorry, was it the GEO or the PUC? Uh, the PUC. The PUC, okay. So um, I, if we could bring in Deirdre at this time, that would be great. Oh, and I see Mitchell Tannenbaum as well. Mitch Tannenbaum and Deirdre Schneider. Jason, thank you very much. And Deirdre, Mitch, uh, would, it, would you like to have the question repeated or did you catch it? I think I understood the question representative foster to be uh concerns that we may have raised in the original bill um my memory is fading very rapidly so i i but what i think is the language was very different and, and maybe representative Gorowski can explain that but i i think what we're looking at now is very different than what we looked at before and we have talked with Representative Krauski, and as far as the commission's ability to uh, implement this, uh, we don't we don't see any any major issues. If I may, Mr. Chair. Yep. Uh, so one of the concerns, Mr. Tannenbaum, at the time Mr. Corbin's uh, uh, testimony was submitted, was that uh, it may result in uh, the commission requiring more resources to uh administer this if you will uh is that no longer the case or yes yeah, so, well no I, I i don't think we would need resources to administer this version uh again i'm having trouble remembering what the original version is um and i think on this version the eminent domain it's not clear whether that has to be approved by the municipal officers or whether the commission has to seek input. Um, again, I read it really quickly. So if, if that's an issue, you might want to clarify that. So um, 
to the question of resources, I think Deirdre had something to add. Yeah, I believe it. I don't see it in this amendment. The original bill had the stakeholder group thing and, and us looking into it. And I think that was where we were talking about resources in, in regards to that portion of the bill. And I'm not seeing that in the current, current amendment. Thank you. That, that is helpful. Representative Foster, was there other? Well, uh, I guess because it's not 100% clear to me, I'll ask a simple question of the PUC. Uh, do you believe that this bill still allows a single municipality, no matter how small or large, to uh, stop a, uh, a project if, uh, if that, uh, say, the town of Abbott Village, which I'm familiar with, uh, uh, selectmen of three, two of them decided they didn't like a project. Would that stop the project with this I don't bill? Think, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, I'll, I'll mention again the eminent domain provision. But I will say it's very rare in, in my experience that a utility had, has had to use eminent domain in order to build a project. But no, I don't see anything in here that would allow a single municipality to block a project that the commission has found to be in the public interest. Thank you. Other discussion, other questions for the PUC? Okay. Um, so I, I'm just gonna ask Deirdre and Mitchell to, uh, to sit with us for a, a moment longer just in case anything else comes up. But uh, Lindsay, is there something from you? I just wanted to clarify the uh, definition of frontline communities comes from LD uh, 2018. So this was the legislation that was developed um, in connection with LD 1682. Um, okay. So it did come from somewhere. And that was the bill I was remembering. Great, thank you very much. All right, any other discussion for the PUC? All right, seeing none, Jason, I guess you can um, move Deirdre and Mitch back over to attendee. Thank you both very much. And are there other uh, members that need information on the proposed amendment. We're we ready for a motion. One, two, three. Representative Grahowski. Um, maybe I'll do everyone the favor of not having to think about what motion I would like to see <laughs> by giving it myself. Um, so I move ought to pass as amended on LD 170 with um, an amendment in the last section three, number four, to um, change it from an affirmative vote of the municipal officers required for eminent domain to the Public Utilities Commission checking in with the municipal officers you know, before they make their decision to approve the eminent domain. Great. And I think that is responsive to the concern raised by Representative Foster. And is there a second? Second it. Seconded by Representative Kessler. All right, it's been moved, out to pass as amended and seconded. Is there discussion? All right, and Representative Carlo, are you still with us? Excellent. And I see, I think I see Representative Wadsworth there. Not sure. Yeah, he's here, okay. Excellent. So Jason, could you please, if there's no other discussion, I'll check one last time. Any other discussion? All right, could you please call the roll? Senator Lawrence. Present, Senator Vitelli. Present, Senator Stewart. No. Senator Stewart is a no. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Oh, present. Representative Grahowski. Yes. Representative Grahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler. Not present. Representative Sachs. Not present. Representative Wadsworth. No. Representative Wadsworth is a no. Representative Grignon. Present. Representative Foster. No. Representative Foster is a no. Representative Carlo. No. 
Representative Carlo is a no. That's three in favor of the motion, four against the motion, six absent. Okay, thank you, Jason. And <clears throat> Lindsay, I think that concludes our work for the day, unless you have anything else for us. I believe that is it. Um, the committee did table LD 1350. It's where I didn't know there was an intent to take that back up. I'll just put that out there. Thank you for that reminder. And I think we are going to leave those bills unvoted at this time. So that's 630, 634 and 1350. And we'll need to reschedule those. And actually one thing to clarify on 170, um, those voting no, is that, is that ought not to pass? Yes. I want to take that. Representative Foster says yes. I see nods. Great. Okay. So tomorrow we have public hearings on, uh, I see seven bills listed. And I believe that uh, if they are concept drafts that the language is in your inbox or will be shortly, I encourage people to, to take a look. And Lindsay, anything else from you before we adjourn? All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Representative Wadsworth makes the motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Foster. All those in favor? See you all later. Meeting adjourned.